What's up guys? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What if I was reborn in Naruto as Branch Yuga? Becoming a Villain, Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. As he walked through the city, Yuta witnessed scenes of immense suffering everywhere. If this had been before he crossed over, Yuta would have been deeply moved, emptying his wallet and even giving away his own clothes to these unfortunate people. However, now, Yuto only felt a sigh in his heart. His steps did not falter as he continued walking towards the city. Living conditions can change a person. When a three-year-old child witnesses the death of their parents and has the caged bird seal carved into their forehead, their heart inevitably hardens. Perhaps Yudo still felt pity for these suffering people, but he no longer had the energy to stop and help them. Life is tough for most people in the world of Shinobi. Passing through the devastated land, Yudo arrived at his destination before nightfall. This town, called Raging Fire City, had a name that sounded as prosperous as a blazing fire. However, due to a winter storm, the finances of the land of hot water were nearly depleted, and many homeless peasants migrated from small villages to Raging Fire City. But the capacity of a town is limited. The guards of Raging Fire City blocked the ragged refugees, giving them only some thin gruel for comfort, and let them freeze outside the city walls. While the walls and snow could block the refugees, they could not block a shinobi. With a simple body flicker technique, Yudo quickly leaped over the wall and entered the city. Security is decent. Yudo murmured as he walked into a tavern, not removing his straw hat. He casually ordered something and squinted his eyes, observing the city. This assassination mission targeted a wealthy man in Raging Fire City, within the land of hot water. The information Yudo received described the target as follows. Asakawa Hiroshi, male, 55 years old, a wealthy man in Raging Fire City who controls 70% of the pharmacies and taverns in the city. In recent years, Asakawa Hiroshi has been funding the separation faction of the land of hot water, which is a stumbling block in the alliance between the land of fire and the land of hot water. He must be eliminated without mercy. The shinobi who wrote the mission scroll was clearly a meticulous person, even adding a small note at the end. Oh note. Separation faction. A recent political force in the land of hot water that advocates distancing from the land of fire to avoid becoming a casualty in conflicts between the two major nations. Every time Yudo read this scroll, he couldn't help but feel a moment of silence for Asakawa Hiroshi. The separation faction in the land of hot water might have seen the painful history of the land of rain and feared that their country would follow the same path, hence their strong emphasis on distancing from Kanoha and avoiding complete dependency. From the perspective of the land of hot water, this idea wasn't wrong. In the world of Shinobi, entangling with a major nation means either becoming a vassal or a battlefield. Moreover, even if they ally with a major nation, the benefits might be minimal. Despite the winter storm, the land of fire hasn't provided any aid. However, from Kanoha's perspective, the separation faction's advocacy means they might lose a crucial buffer, a strategic concern that cannot be ignored. The core of the separation faction are political stars whom they cannot easily assassinate, but they can still deal with you, the investor behind the scenes. These matters always have different rationales, while Yudo understood this, he could only act as Kanoha's killing tool. Shinobi, human-shaped killing machines, sometimes don't need many emotions. It's just your bad luck, wealthy man. Yudo ate and drank his fill, paid the bill, and leisurely walked down the street. 
activating his Byakugan, his vision became clear again. It took Yudo only a short time to locate his target. The tallest building to the north, the second room from the left on the fourth floor. Ha, huh, a diligent man indeed, still working even as night falls. With an expressionless face, Yudo adjusted his hat to ensure no identifying information was exposed and strode towards the building. On the way, he stealthily took a fire poker from a street vendor, making sure to leave enough silver in the vendor's purse. Stop. Who are you? You there, short guy. This is Asakawa's territory, no outsiders allowed. Move away, move away. You. Buzz. Without lifting an eyelid, Yudo gently knocked the guard on the head with the fire poker. Even without using chakra, a shinobi's physical strength far surpassed that of an ordinary person. With less than half his strength, he knocked the guard out. Bang. 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 In three more strikes, Yudo effortlessly knocked out all the guards. He didn't linger, leaping to the fourth floor with a heavy stomp, smashing through the glass and charging into the room. For an assassination, this method of entry was somewhat flamboyant, but as long as no one identified the attacker, it was still successful. In this world, becoming a wealthy man wasn't easy. Becoming a rich man likely meant having many enemies, so having a few grudges was normal. Glass shattered as Yudo entered the room. Through his Byakugan, he saw several chakra sources quickly approaching from a nearby room. As an A-rank mission target, Asakawa Hiroshi was wealthy enough to hire Shinobi to protect himself. Unfortunately, too slow. Can you really call yourself Shinobi? Yudo chuckled, looking at the middle-aged man before him. You are, wait. I have something to say. No matter who hired you, I can offer. His words were cut short by a sharp kanai. Yudo mercilessly plunged the kanai into Asakawa Hiroshi's heart, using a slight force with his forearm to make the heart explode. The assassination mission was complete. From beginning to end, Yudo made it look as easy as crushing an ant. With Jonin-level combat skills from one of the five great nations, he was indeed overpowered in a small country city. The branch family boy swung the kunai again, cutting off Asakawa Hiroshi's ear. Such wealthy men were public figures. Once they died, Kanoha and the Land of Fire's leaders would know immediately, so there was no need to seal the entire corpse into a scroll. Through his Byakugan, Yudo saw the shinobi guards had already reached the next room. Did they really not have time? Or were they afraid of losing their lives and thus dawdled? Yudo didn't bother to think about it. He symbolically threw down an explosive tag, using the firelight and smoke to escape through the window. The entire assassination took less than five seconds. With a thud, Yudo landed in the snow. Bursting his chakra, he quickly left the city. Next came his free time. Land of Frost, Renzen Mountain. The mountains resembled teeth, straight and sharp, connected by iron chains between peak. In the depths of winter, the chains were covered with frost, making it impossible for birds to pass. Kawamoto Saikairo tightened his cotton coat, huddling behind a large rock, unable to stop stomping his feet. Bandits establish their position through violence and naturally don't emphasize honor and loyalty like in legendary stories. The hierarchy among them is strict. Despite Saikairo's strength, he was new and thus had to stand guard in the snowstorm. Stand guard? Guard against what? Those bastards are inside feasting, while I have to stay out here. Saikairo muttered angrily. The cold wind howled, making Saikairo shiver and stomp his feet hard. Damn it! Who could possibly climb Renzen Mountain in this weather? Better find a place to hide. Maybe sneak some wine to warm up. He cursed as he stood up, planning to sneak into the house for some food. Bandits, after all, had rules, but they weren't as disciplined as a regular army. Leaving the post during the night watch was common. However, just as Saikairo stood straight and subconsciously looked out at the mountain, he was struck by disbelief, frozen in place. In the dark, snowy night, a figure suddenly appeared in midair. This person was walking on the iron chains connecting the peaks, not minding the icy, slippery chains, 
balancing and controlling their body with terrifying precision. Saikairo rubbed his eyes, thinking he was hallucinating from the cold. He rubbed his eyes hard, and when he opened them, the figure on the chain had disappeared. Then, the figure appeared in front of him. Renzen Mountain, huh? What an excellent defensible place. The young, clear voice was the last thing Kawamoto Saikairo heard. Bang! Yudo's hand gently tapped the sturdy bandit's chest, easily destroying all his internal organs, stopping his heart instantly, leading to immediate death. The branch family boy pushed the bandit's corpse aside, put on a straw hat and covered his face. Then, he held a kunai in each hand and calmly walked deeper into the bandit's lair. The main peak of Renzen Mountain was the base of these bandits. The person who initially built this hideout must have been quite knowledgeable. It was modeled after an ant nest with main and side routes. Even if attacked by a strong enemy, the bandit leader could escape through underground passages. That is, if he had time, Yudo's killing speed was too fast. After taking out the sentry, he walked only about a hundred meters to reach the lair's gate. Without any words, the inside of his Byakugan was a lethal weapon on such a snowy night. Three kunai almost simultaneously pierced the guards' heads, slicing off half their skulls without a sound. Then, the one-sided massacre began. Inside the warm mountain, the bandits were drinking, laughing, and sharing their recent loot. Each carried the scent of blood, wearing clothes stained red with it. The dried blood was not theirs. In fact, they didn't know whose it was. They burned, killed, and looted daily. Who had the time to remember the poor souls they slaughtered? Suddenly, the cold wind blew in, and the door was blasted apart. The thick wooden door, reinforced with iron, shattered into splinters. No bandits saw the attacker. What they saw was a spray of blood. The attacker was as fast as lightning, clean and ruthless, crushing bandit throats with a single thrust. Bones, tendons, internal organs, muscles, all were useless before the unstoppable force. Limbs were severed, blood flowed like a river. This world belongs to the shinobi. The name of the great power is Chakra. Before a jonin from Kanoha, even the strongest bandits were as fragile as tofu. The wooden splinters danced in the cold wind, and before they hit the ground, the bandits on this level were already dead. Then, Yudo kicked open the second wooden door. He was expressionless, cutting through the next level like a nail through tofu, turning it into a bloody hell before moving further down. The third level, the fourth level, the fifth level. The killing was so simple. Yudo met no resistance until the final level. Clang. Yudo looked up in surprise at the strong man who blocked his strike and was knocked back. Oh, a shinobi? The bandit leader gasped for breath, feeling the pain in his nearly broken wrist, terrified. Sir, please spare me. We have already paid taxes to the land of frost. Uh, government collusion? Yudo shook his head and moved again, using his Byakugan's insight and his solid physical skills to fight with Kanai in close combat. Due to killing so many, the Kanai's blades were jagged like shark teeth. The bandit leader struggled to defend himself, soon covered in blood. Sir, please spare me. Too disgraceful. A shinobi should charge forward on their chosen path until death. When you led this rabble to burn and kill, you should have anticipated this day. This is the path you chose as a shinobi. Sir, no. I can still be useful. I stole a lot of money this money. This money, after you're all dead, is mine. Yudo said calmly, but then he thought of something and smiled. Oh, there is one thing you can help with. Hearing this, the bandit leader was overjoyed, but before he could say anything, his enemy's speed exploded, becoming a blur. The kunai flashed, severing the tendons in the bandit leader's hands and feet. Then, a glowing white hand slammed into the bandit leader's face. The next moment, the bandit leader saw nothing. Ah, my eyes. Ah! Oh. The pain and fear of blindness overwhelmed him. The bandit leader collapsed, screaming like those he had once tortured. Amidst the endless fear, the bandit leader faintly heard the voice of his powerful enemy. The voice was calm and steady, 
as if chatting with an old friend. The muscles around your eyes were cut neatly, but your corneas are damaged, and the fluid inside is leaking. Mm. As expected of a shinobi, you instinctively covered your eyes with chakra, countering my medical ninjutsu, causing your optic nerves to be completely destroyed. In summary, these eyes are useless. My hands are fast, but not steady enough. My chakra control needs more precision. But it's okay. This was just practice. There will be many more opportunities in the future. The lessons learned from this failure will be applied next time. Bang. In an instant, the bandit leader's head flew off, and his eyes were casually discarded. The bandits were all exterminated. A valley somewhere in the land of frost. Yudo, wearing a conical hat, walked through the wind and snow. The massacre three hours ago didn't affect his state of mind much. It was too thorough of a crush, and he had killed bandits who viewed human life as insignificant. He felt no pressure while killing them. Yudo was not a pervert who enjoyed killing and gouging out eyes, nor was he a righteous enforcer of justice. He killed that group of bandits for one purpose only, to obtain a large amount of money. The history of the world of Shinobi is long, with well-established and self-consistent systems. Despite the presence of supernatural powers like Chakra, with top-tier warriors capable of moving mountains and filling seas, everyone, including those strong individuals, still existed in the same world and society. Living in a society naturally means forming bonds with others, relationships, kindness, morality, dreams. In the shinobi world, money is still very important, even particularly important. Many years later, even an organization as powerful as Akatsuki couldn't completely detach from society and needed diligent members like Kakuzu to earn money. If the Akatsuki lacked funds, they couldn't afford those cool cloud-patterned robes. Yudo, of course, needed money too. Some bandits were exceptionally good at plundering wealth. If he converted all the loot from this raid, including jewelry and silver, into money, it would be equivalent to the reward for completing 10 B-rank missions. This was a large sum, enough to serve as Yudo's starting capital. With less than half a year left until the Third Shinobi World War, he had to be prepared. In the snowstorm, Yudo ran toward his destination, his feet barely leaving shallow indentations in the snow, which soon got covered by falling snow, leaving no trace. Along the way, although he didn't particularly observe, his Byakugan, activated at intervals for safety, still allowed him to see countless corpses buried under the snow. Many of these were adults holding children. If there were a heaven, one might think that dying in this posture would help children quickly find their parents. If there were a heaven, Yudo sighed inwardly, feeling a mix of emotions. A few days ago, when Tsunade saw him off, he felt much the same. Yudo knew very well that this probably proved he still had a conscience, understood compassion and gratitude, and was not a complete monster. In another environment, he might even be called a good person. However, even though Yudo still had human emotions and a baseline, he also knew what his role in this world was. A villain, a nailed-down villain, whether he would be a minor villain who met an early end or the final boss who lived until the end, Yudo Hugo was a villain. What is a villain? Disposition, moral level, strength, deeds. None of these are sufficient to determine whether someone is a villain. The standard for being a villain has always been only one, whether they oppose the protagonist. Standing opposite the protagonist makes one a villain. Would Yudo stand against Naruto? Since the age of three, when he was marked with the caged bird seal, Yudo could answer definitively. Yes, my future self will definitely be Naruto's enemy, with no room for compromise. Hyuga is an enemy, so Konoha is an enemy, so Naruto is also an enemy. This is a very simple logic chain. Actually, in the first few years, Yudo was somewhat resistant to becoming a villain. Standing opposite the protagonist comes with immense pressure. Yudo dared to bet that if those villainous characters in literary works knew from the start that their opponent was the protagonist loved by the world, most would lose the will to fight. 
Moreover, the psychological pressure on Yudo was even greater. As a transmigrator, he still had some baseline in his heart. He might be ruthless enough to do something terribly monstrous, but he wouldn't feel too comfortable doing it. To be fair, Naruto, the protagonist of this world, is a good person from any angle. Even if he talks a lot, he is still a good person. Opposing a good person is actually quite an uncomfortable thing. However, today, after killing all the bandits, as Yudo walked through the snow, looking at the countless buried corpses, his mood gradually calmed down. He suddenly felt that even if the great good person Naruto became Hokage and the savior, this world hadn't changed at least, it hadn't clearly become better. Niji died, the branch family members still bore the caged bird seal. The world still had the five great shinobi villages, and the living conditions of the small countries had never been guaranteed. The nine-tailed beasts still scattered across the land, and it was hard to say they had gained freedom. In the years when the Six Paths level Naruto Uzumaki was invincible, maintaining the old world's order with the equally invincible Sasuke Uchiha, there was peace among the five great nations, shinobi put down their grudges, and civilians lived in peace. Under Naruto's golden chakra, there were no contradictions, nor dared there be any. Had the world changed? Yes. Had the world not changed? It had never changed. If we extend time to the entire history, in a sense, Naruto had almost done nothing. While traveling, Yudo suddenly recalled the words of a writer he admired in his previous life. Almost all the evil villains in fantasy novels are charismatic and ideologically radical revolutionaries. They dare to imagine a completely different world order and can't wait to ignite the seeds of change before conditions are ripe. In contrast, all the great, bright, and righteous heroes are defenders of mainstream ideology. They are conservative, lack creativity, and besides fighting monsters and hugging girls at home, they have almost no other pursuits. Running, Yudo put down the burden in his heart. A villain is a villain. Opposing the child of prophecy even sounds kind of cool. The young man suddenly chuckled. With his thoughts swirling, Yudo unknowingly arrived at his destination, a deserted temple. He was already familiar with such places. Using a transformation jutsu, he changed his appearance to that of an adult, donned his conical hat again, put on a wide robe, and walked in slowly. Skillfully, he stopped at the third stone pillar from the right at the entrance, made a few hand signs, and pressed his chakra-laden hand onto it. A secret passage appeared. Yudo walked down the stone-carved steps, and in the light of oil lamps embedded in the rock walls, he entered a spacious underground stone chamber. Welcome to the land of Frost Branch of the Bounty Station, sir. A woman wearing a mouse-faced mask said softly inside the chamber. Please state your name. Yudo's lips curled slightly under the hat as he spoke the nostalgic alias he had chosen for convenience in the dark world, Aizen Sosuke. Aizen Sosuke-sama, please verify the key. Hmm. Yudo's voice was cold. He made a few hand signs. Simple gestures, but their speed and sequence created thousands of different combinations. The keys to enter the underground world were diverse. Physical objects, passwords, hand signs. There were many ways to verify identity, but they all had one common trait. They weren't completely bound to a person. In other words, after killing someone, you could take their place in the underground world as long as the entry code matched. No one would chase you for it. Violent takeovers were in line with the rules here. The bounty station was such a chaotic yet orderly underground world. In his previous life, Yudo had only glanced at the bounty station name while reading manga. His memory associated it with Kakuzu carrying a Suma Saratobi's corpse to exchange for a large bounty. But after arriving in the Naruto world, Yudo knew the bounty station was a behemoth spanning the entire land. It had numerous bases and branches and controlled the largest black and gray market networks globally. Assassinations, mercenary wars, forbidden experiments, the trade of contraband, the mission boards of the major shinobi villages always had a moral facade. At least on the surface, 
They couldn't do anything too disgraceful. The world needed an entity like the Bounty Station, a loose alliance of interests, to contain the filth and distortions beneath the sunlight. The Bounty Station was the hidden sixth great shinobi village. After verifying the identity code, the woman with a rat-faced mask bowed slightly. Aizen Sosuke-sama, welcome to the second branch of the Land of Frost Bounty Station. I have a batch of items to deal with. Understood, please follow me. The woman responded respectfully, lightly touching the wall to activate a mechanism that opened a narrow door. She led the way, exposing her unguarded back to Yudo. Her pale neck and waist moved like a water snake, swaying gently. She isn't a shinobi, Yudo concluded, following her into the secret passage. Anyone trained as a shinobi and successfully refined chakra would find it hard to completely drop their guard. Even if they had to turn their back, their toes would subtly angle to be ready for an attack. This was a side effect of long training, impossible to change. Of course, the receptionist not being a shinobi didn't mean the bounty station was poorly guarded. Even without activating his Byakugan, Yudo could feel a tightness in his spine, indicating the presence of genuine shinobi, with sufficient numbers and quality. Aizen Sosuke-sama, we will complete the exchange here. The rat-faced woman led him to a more secluded chamber and skillfully stepped back a few paces. With a puff of smoke, Yudo activated the scroll in his hand, pouring out the sealed gold and silver treasures onto the ground. Please wait a moment. The rat-faced woman squatted down, taking out various tools to carefully appraise the value of the items. Aizen Sosuke-sama, these treasures are worth a total of 47 million Rio. If you want to exchange them for the common currency of the five great nations, the bounty station will deduct a 45% fee. We guarantee these funds will be clean. No need. Damn, that's steep, Yudo thought, rolling his eyes internally before continuing. Use it all here. I need to buy some things. Certainly, Aizen Sosuke-sama. The rat-faced woman's voice had a hint of cheerfulness. It seemed that in any world, salespeople loved customers who spent all their money. Here's what I need, take note. 12 sets of nano-level filters and related equipment, 6 large medical breeding tanks of 1 meter by 2 meters, 20 tons of formalin, surgical knives slash mosquito clamps slash toothed forceps all must be made in the land of iron. The bounty station receptionists were carefully selected and trained talent. Although not shinobi, they were smart. Yudo listed a mix of medical equipment, some with obscure names, but the rat-faced woman remembered it all, quickly correlating with warehouse inventory and necessary funds. The lids of the culture dishes must be opaque. Hmm. That's all. Yudo listed his needs, specifying even the model and manufacturer for some tools. Having studied medical ninjutsu under Tsunade for over three months, Yudo was well aware of the intricacies in this world's medical field. The woman wrote down everything on a scroll and placed it into a small shoot. Aizen Sosuke-sama, all these items are in stock at the Land of Frost branch. Please wait patiently, everything will be delivered within half an hour. How much is left? Seven million Rio. Convert it all to wood, the kind from the red forests in southern fire country, cut into blocks. Any specific size for the wood, sir? Standard one cubic meter. Understood, sir. The wood will be delivered along with the medical tools. As a bounty station receptionist, the rat-faced woman was experienced and immediately realized the customer likely wanted to establish a secret lab. A large medical breeding tank of 1 meter by 2 meters, clearly intended for holding humans, and the 20 tons of formalin. The rat-faced woman could hardly imagine how many people the customer planned to kill. Aizen Sosuke-sama, is truly a terrifying man who brings death. The rat-faced woman pondered, not daring to ask questions or speak out of turn. The bounty station employed non-shinobi receptionists, implying that if you kill them, it's just peripheral staff, as long as you pay afterward. In such a corrupt underground world, the naive belief in protecting comrades was hard to find. Oh, by the way, 
Yudo, feeling bored while waiting, spoke up. Bring me the bounty list, I want to take a look. Yes, Aizen Sosuke-sama. This was easy. The woman had a copy in her sleeve. Yudo took it, browsing through names while considering how long he could continue operating outside and searching for suitable target. He still needed money. Yudo's eyes scanned each name before returning the assassination list to the rat-faced woman. The chamber fell silent again until a large scroll appeared through the chute. Sir, this contains all your purchased items. You may inspect them here. Per the bounty station rules, we will deny this transaction once you leave this door. Yudo nodded indifferently, checking a few critical medical tools. Satisfied, he strapped the scroll to his back and walked out of the bounty station. Yudo quickly returned to the land of hot water. The land of frost's territory was small, and when Yudo crossed the border, the sky was only just beginning to lighten. Using the last cover of night, he found a valley and raised his fist, smashing it downwards. Using his chakra enhanced strength on his wrist, the ground trembled slightly, creating a two-meter deep pit. Bang, 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 another series of punches hit the ground. Soon, an L-shaped underground structure appeared in front of him, with the deepest part reaching 40 meters below the surface. Yudoa's hands were wrapped in a glowing blue light, a medical ninjutsu similar to the chakra scalpel, perfect for cutting tumors off a patient's surface, but now used to smooth out the tunnel's soil. Flattening the protruding rocks in the pit, Yudo activated a scroll, releasing blocks of red wood. These trees, growing in the southern red forest of the Land of Fire, were moisture-resistant, insect-proof, and soundproof, making them the best material for the outer walls of an underground base. After building the walls, Yudo sealed the soil and rocks he had dug out into a scroll, planning to dispose of them elsewhere. The subsequent work was detailed and tedious. Multiple security devices, deadly traps at the underground base entrance, ventilation and sewage pipes, and emergency escape tunnels. Yudo even buried a significant number of explosive tags at the deepest point. These were self-destruct mechanisms powerful enough to collapse the entire underground base, burying all evidence. Finally, Yudo placed the tools he had bought from the bounty station in the secret base. Six large medical tanks were lined up, facing a long metal table covered with various medical tools and instruments. Everything in order, Yudo exhaled lightly and lay on the ground. The dim oil lamp burned slowly. An underground chamber always conjures thoughts of eerie darkness, but to Yudo, this place was more comfortable than the Hyuga clan grounds. This was entirely his own, a secret base. At this moment, he was the only one here, but with the outbreak of war, this place would no longer be lonely. I made a lot of money, but it's still not enough, thought Yudo as he lay on the ground. According to his plan, he needed six more secret bases. All these bases would be in small countries, more specifically, each small country bordering the land of fire. Yudo planned to establish an underground stronghold in each to store medical tools and supplies. The upcoming Third Shinobi World War would last three years. Yudo didn't know which battlefields he would be sent to, so, like a cautious rabbit, he decided to set up secret bases in all possible locations to store and research his spoils of war. Yudo lay down for a while and dozed off. The underground environment made it hard to sense time, and when he woke up, his head felt a bit groggy, clearly from oversleeping. He knocked his head, sat up, and started planning his next move. It had been about two days since he killed the wealthy defector in the land of hot water. Such public figures' deaths spread quickly, so the upper echelons of the Land of Fire and Kanoha would certainly know the assassination target was dead. Kanoha shinobi missions were not indefinite. Generally, assassinations required reporting back within five days. Considering unforeseen circumstances like being pursued by strong enemies, the reporting time could be extended to ten days. But for Yudo, this time was clearly not enough. Doing village missions could never be as profitable as getting high bounties from the bounty station. Besides, if the next mission required a team, it would be hard for Yudo to find an excuse to act alone. 
Taking advantage of this opportunity, he had to make more money and establish two more bases. Yudo took out paper and a pen and, after careful consideration, began writing a letter to Tsunade, Dear Sensei, I have completed the mission but had a sudden inspiration regarding the new jutsu while returning to the village. Therefore, I want to stay outside for a while longer. I will definitely return within a month. When you receive this letter, the news of the assassination target, Asakawa Hiroshi's death, should have reached Konoha. Please convey my greetings and apologies to the Hokage. Also, Sensei, I saw a beautiful jade in the land of hot water, said to bring good luck. After checking the content of the letter and confirming there were no mistakes, Yudo left the base, put on a cotton coat, and walked alone into the snow until he crossed over a dozen mountains before stopping. He put his thumb in his mouth, bit it, and then pressed his whole hand against a tree. Summoning Jutsu, with a bang, after a puff of white smoke, a peculiar creature appeared, about the size of an adult's torso. Its appearance was that of a soft-bodied creature, somewhat like a shellless snail, with small eyes at the ends of its two antennae, both a bit disgusting and inexplicably cute. This was Tsunade's summoning beast, Katsu. Of course, this was just a small part of the giant Katsu. After becoming Tsunade's disciple, Yudo signed a blood contract for summoning in the third month. Ah, uh, yudo Kuen, it's so cold here. Katsuyu started shivering as soon as it appeared in the icy wilderness. Its soft body looked increasingly stiff, almost like it was about to freeze. What a nice voice. Yudo thought mischievously, respectfully saying, Katsuyu-sama, sorry for summoning you here. To be brief, I would like you to deliver a letter to my sensei. Katsuyu swallowed the letter. Just as it was about to disappear, Yudo stopped it. Eh. Katsuyu-sama, wait. Please also deliver this jade pendant to my sensei. It's a beautiful warm jade said to bring good luck. Haha, <laughs> my sensei loves good luck. The jade pendant was something left behind by a group of bandits, kept as a treasure by their leader. It was indeed beautiful, warm to the touch, and even had a natural chin character pattern on it, making it perfect for Tsunade. Whether as a senju or a gambling addict, the blonde woman would likely appreciate it. When out of money, it could be a valuable item to pawn for another round, full of both aesthetic and practical value. The essence of being a good disciple lies in these seemingly insignificant details. Yudo, the little rascal, never missed an opportunity to touch his teacher's heart. Ah, Yudo Kuen is so thoughtful. Katsuyu was a gentle summoning beast, very kind to people, unlike the violent snake and rogue toad it was often compared to. Because of Tsunade, it saw Yudo as a kohai. It swallowed the jade pendant and vanished with a bang. After Katsuyu left, Yudo breathed a sigh of relief. Being Tsunade's disciple was crucial. Just her protection and connections provided him with great convenience. When Yudo left the land of hot water and traversed the entire land of fire, the new year had already passed. The air was filled with lingering joy, and the heavy snow gradually ceased. In the uninhabited forest, it was peaceful and beautiful. A heavy snow heralds a good year. The end of year snow seemed to promise a prosperous future. Unfortunately, Yudo knew that the Third Shinobi World War was brewing. The conflicts between nations were irreconcilable, and a war that would engulf everyone was about to erupt. Kanoha Year 56 marked a bloody beginning. During this journey, he didn't use high speed, and it took him five full days to traverse the land of fire. As he approached the border, after crossing several small mountain ranges, Yudo felt the air become significantly more humid. When he crossed over the mountains and entered the land of rain, the sky began to drizzle. The climate in the world of Shinobi is unpredictable and cannot be analyzed using meteorological knowledge from his past life. The land of rain is located in the central part of the continent. Except for the southeastern direction, it has no high mountains. Logically, it should be windy, dry, and stuffy. However, the fact is that the land of rain is perpetually rainy. The sky is always a heavy leaden gray, damp and cold. It can be said that it's rainy all year round, 
making it unsuitable for human habitation. Moreover, this unfortunate country is located between the three major nations of fire, wind, and earth. Whenever there is conflict, the land of rain becomes the battlefield for the three major shinobi villages, causing great suffering. Very few children can safely reach adulthood. Amage Cure struggles tenaciously in such a harsh environment. Many shinobi from Amage Cure are skilled in assassination techniques and are often hired as assassins. The leader of Amage Cure, Hanzo of the Salamander, is known as a demigod due to his strength. But these combat skills seem useless, as the land of rain and Amage Cure still suffer greatly. Eternal rain is the tears of the deceased, someone once remarked. After entering the territory of Amage Cure, Yudo adjusted his attire. He didn't use the transformation jutsu, only wore dark goggles to cover his pure white eyes, and then removed his forehead protector, tying a dark blue headband to hide the caged bird curse mark. At this time, Amage Cure was still under the rule of Hanzo of the Salamander. Although not as closed off as during the later Pain era, it still didn't welcome foreign shinobi. Hiding his affiliation with Kanoha and the Hyuga clan was beneficial. In less than half a day, Yudo arrived in Amage Cure. Under the leaden sky, continuous rain fell. Below it, towering, straight, and menacing steel buildings stood tall. Numerous metal pipes were exposed outside, resembling mythical roaring serpents. Chimneys spewed steam and cables traversed the air, giving off a strange punk aesthetic. The shinobi world truly has many people who understand art, Yudo thought as he stepped into Amage Cure. To a village plagued by constant war and assassination techniques, Yudo, cloaked in a black robe with even his eyes covered, was not particularly unusual. No one paid special attention to him. The few pedestrians on the street wore thick trench coats, most with gloomy expressions, hurrying along, lacking the leisurely atmosphere of Kanoha. Yudo didn't wander around aimlessly. He found a street corner to avoid the rain and quietly observed the street, calming his body as Tsunade had taught him. He came to Amage Cure to kill. Earning quick money from the bounty station was much more efficient than doing village missions. Although it was risky without support or teammates, completing one job would allow him to establish another secret base. Killing was not unfamiliar to Yudo Hyuga. Although only 13, he had long since lost count of the number of people who had died by his hand. But coming to Amage Cure to kill Amage Cure Shinobi was a first for Yudo. Having no support or teammates meant he had no retreat or sufficient intelligence. He couldn't know his target's real-time location and had no way to understand the enemy's numbers or their preferred jutsu. However, Yudo knew that with patience, he would soon encounter his target. His wait didn't last long. At a certain moment, the sound of raindrops hitting the steel buildings was interrupted by a lot of noise. A large group of people was coming, in a crowd. Stop the war. Stop the killing. People need to communicate with each other. Build a bridge of hope towards world peace. Yudo looked up, a slight smile on his lips. In the rain, marching down the street, were people holding signs. Most were dressed as civilians, their expressions excited, shouting hoarsely. But a closer look revealed a few individuals in standard high-collared black trench coats walking among them, their eyes vigilant, clearly protecting the marchers. The young Hyuga branch family member crossed his arms, watching these people with interest. These individuals all belonged to the Akatsuki organization. The slogans of the marchers were created by Yahiko, the current leader of Akatsuki. Change the country, build a bridge of hope towards world peace through communication between people. This was the initial principle set by Yahiko when Akatsuki was founded. Though idealistic, it was not laughable. Yahiko's passionate vision filled this phrase. He inspired his companions with his fervor and influenced many more with his actions. At its inception, Akatsuki was a mercenary organization, but it already had a clear ideological attribute. Now, in the land of rain, Akatsuki's influence was growing daily, with more people joining the march. 
The name Akatsuki was gradually appearing in the reports of major forces. Similarly, many of its members were also appearing on the bounty lists at the bounty station. Yudo tilted his head, observing the march. He noticed that the Akatsuki shinobi were becoming increasingly tense. Looking closely, he could see their fingers already brushing against Kanai, ready to act at any moment. The youth thought to himself, professional. This intersection was quite narrow, with four tall buildings blocking it, clearly a perfect spot for an ambush. Boom. Sure enough, at that moment, explosions suddenly erupted. Several bursts of fire exploded, with huge shock waves and flames evaporating the rain at the intersection, blowing the water hundreds of meters away. Dozens of figures suddenly appeared, emerging from the water or the walls, accompanied by sharp whistling sounds, all rushing towards a specific part of the crowd. Water release. Water formation wall. The attacked person shouted loudly, quickly forming hand seals. Chakra surged out, forming a sturdy water wall, protecting themselves and the civilians. Escort the civilians away, they are coming for me. The attacked person was unafraid, clearly experienced with such situations. They jumped out, holding two bright white short daggers, and charged at the attackers. This person was Yudo's target, the current fourth-ranked member of Akatsuki, Takeda Takashi. In the rain, a fierce battle erupted. The attackers, either wearing masks or covering their faces with scarves, all hid their true identities. Their use of ninjutsu was disjointed, including water release, wind release, and weapon technique. They had no mutual understanding, relying only on instinct to coordinate. Like Yudo, they also saw the bounty on Takeda Takashi's head at the bounty station and were drawn by the huge reward to take on the assassination job. The Land of Rain, plagued by civil war and divided among various factions, was far from united. The death of a jonin wouldn't cause a stir, making it a favored hunting ground for assassins. The killers aimed to eliminate Takeda swiftly. Although the Land of Rain was perpetually in turmoil, the newly risen Akatsuki organization was reputedly united. If the battle dragged on, reinforcements for Takeda would place the assassins in a dire situation. However, Takeda was formidable. He excelled in water release techniques, and his taijutsu was above standard. He wielded two chakra short swords that emitted a dazzling white light when swung, slicing through kanai effortlessly. The unique hum of the chakra short swords cutting through the rain could be heard, as Takeda used the water body flicker technique to swiftly move behind one of the assassins. His blade slashed down, effortlessly slicing the enemy's body in half like cutting through butter. Bang! Takeda eliminated one opponent but exposed his back in the process. Another assassin, seizing the opportunity, hardened his arm with rock and struck Takeda's spine, sending him flying into the wall of a steel building, denting the alloy. Yudo raised an eyebrow. He's as strong as a special jonin from Kanoha? The key point to watch out for is those two chakra weapons. However, it seems Mr. Takeda won't last much longer. Observing the battlefield, Yudo noted that under the continuous assault, Takeda's injuries were mounting. Though he had taken down two more assassins, it was evident he couldn't hold out much longer. No choice but to intervene, Yudo thought, needing the money. He concentrated his chakra in his eyes, activating his Byakugan, and the gray-black translucent vision reappeared. Huh. Yudo frowned, pausing his movement. With his Byakugan, he saw a figure hidden underground. Screech. A loud friction sound was heard as an assassin blocked Takeda's chakra sword with a web-like substance. Despite its fragile appearance, it was extremely tough, withstanding the first wave of the chakra weapon's impact and then entwining around it, rendering it immobile. Haha. <laughs> a head worth 30 million Ryo. The assassin laughed, reversing his kunai to slit Takeda Takashi's throat. Unexpectedly, just as he was about to decapitate his prize, searing pain shot through his leg. Wind release. Wind cutter technique. A fine wind blade struck from below, destroying the muscles in the assassin's leg and severely damaging the bones. Splat. 
Takeda seized the opportunity, driving his chakra blade forward to easily slice the assassin's throat. A woman emerged from the ground, standing back to back with Takeda. Keiru, what are you doing here? Takeda, having been rescued, was anxious. You, you're too chatty, Captain. Men are more attractive when they're silent. Humph. Takeda mumbled something and fell silent. In the rain, the slaughter resumed. Takeda Takashi and Keiru Asano's coordination was astonishing. Yudo observed that they needed no verbal communication or even eye contact to execute a perfect combination attack. The hastily assembled assassins were no match for the duo's seamless teamwork. After losing three more members, the assassins from the bounty station finally lost their resolve and fled using various escape technique. Panting heavily, Takeda wiped the sweat and blood from his face, turning to say, Keiru, thank you for this, but you're still injured. It's nothing. Keiru's expression was cold, her words biting. Captain, if you really want to die, you could just jump into the river yourself. At least that way, you'd leave a whole corpse. Keiru you. I didn't want to face 15 to 1, but I had to make sure all the civilians were safe before retreating. If you had escaped at the start, the assassins would have followed you. What if they didn't and started slaughtering the protesters to force me out? Heh. Keiru shook her head, her tone indifferent. Your life is worth more than those civilians. They die you live. That's the proper way of things. Keiru. Takeda started to lecture earnestly. We Akatsuki were established for the greater good. The conflict between people stems from inadequate communication. As our leader says, we must become the bridge of the world. Their idle chat was interrupted by approaching footstep. They turned, instantly standing ready, cold sweat dripping as they prepared for a new battle. A figure wearing tinted goggles and a thick black cloak emerged from the shadows. Veins bulged ominously around his eyes. Yudo walked towards them silently. He could see clearly that both opponents were as strong as special Jonin, highly synchronized in their cooperation. Though they appeared to be idle chatting, they remained on alert. Cornered enemies would be difficult to handle. Thus, Yudo activated his Byakugan and pressed forward, intending to gain a psychological edge from the start. Keiru Asano clasped her hands together, quietly gathering chakra to perform another technique. At that moment, Takeda spoke first, Byakugan, you're a Kanoha Shinobi. Yudo nodded slightly. Seeing an opportunity for dialogue, Takeda continued, I don't know why you're in the land of rain, nor do I know if your purpose is to kill me, but as a subordinate, I must convey my leader's will. My leader wants to find a Kanoha Shinobi. Yahiko? Seeking a Kanoha Shinobi? Yudo was startled. My leader says he wants to ask a favor of a Kanoha Shinobi. As a reassurance, you can choose the place and time. Takeda shrugged. He said that in a critical situation, this might save a life. Of course, that's if you're interested in our leader. So, what do you say? Unknown Hyuga, fight or parley. What is the greatest advantage of a transmigrator? Besides knowing the world's development trends, the most important thing is understanding the personalities of the main characters. Hypocrites, upright gentlemen, conspirators. No matter how well they hide, they cannot escape the transmigrator's eyes. After all, they've read the original work. The world's development might change due to the transmigrator's involvement, but the main character's personalities are hard to alter. Yudo knew very well what Yahiko, Conan, and Nagato were like inside. At least for now, these three are positive figures. Among them, Yahiko, as the founder and leader of the Akatsuki, can almost be seen as a young Naruto Uzumaki. Passionate, valuing friendship, persistent about his dreams, resilient, and very naive. Yudo knew that meeting these three posed no danger. He glanced at the tense Takeda Takashi and Keru Asano before him and smiled lightly. Do you know why I came to Emigekure? And why I want to meet your leader? Takeda answered with undisguised pride. In recent years, no shinobi from other countries have come to Amigekure without being interested in our leader. 
Even assassins here to make money don't mind getting information about him. It's more valuable than a human head. He spoke openly and honestly. The Akatsuki, huh? All right, you've convinced me. The tension slowly faded, and Yudo took a few steps back, creating a safer distance. I'll give you your life back now. Takeda and Keru both sighed in relief. That distance was too close for a close combat expert like the Hyuga clan. It's great to solve problems without fighting, Takeda muttered, but after Keru discreetly pinched him, he said seriously, friend from Kanoha, where do you want to meet? We can leave a radio. That's not necessary. Yudo shrugged. I'll go with you directly, is that convenient? Takeda was stunned for a moment. Does this guy trust us so much? Not afraid of an ambush? Have we already achieved world peace? What? Is it inconvenient? Yudo asked. No, it's fine. Keru and I need to return to the base for treatment anyway. If you don't mind, come with us. Supporting each other, they walked into an alley, with Yudo leisurely following behind, looking more relaxed than the two in front. The buildings in Amigekure are very distinctive, tall and sharp steel structures, with narrow alleys flanked by straight metal walls. The narrow paths are used to create great psychological pressure. They weaved through the alleys and finally entered a large underground tunnel, walking for over 30 minutes. Don't worry, Amigekure's underground complex is huge, Takeda explained kindly. It's always rainy here, so the city's drainage system has to be the best in the world. It's been expanding for years, and even maintenance workers don't know all the hidden places. Why do you hide underground? Yudo was curious. He knew that at this time, the Akatsuki had a good relationship with Hanzo of the Salamander and wasn't targeted. We're not really hiding, Takeda said nonchalantly. Rent on the surface is too expensive. Huh. Yudo didn't understand for a moment. As a shinobi from Kanoha and a big clan, you wouldn't know the cost of everyday life. Takeda was very patient. Ninja tools cost money, medical treatment costs money, training costs money, food costs money, and so do propaganda and combat. The Akatsuki is quite large now, and we need a lot of money. We can't afford to rent such a large place. Luckily, the village's underground structure is vast, very convenient, though it feels a bit like we're living as rats. Takeda suddenly groaned, falling silent. His subordinate had pinched him again. Yudo found the duo amusing, a straightforward captain and a cold, sharp-tongued subordinate. In modern terms, they had a strange chemistry. He thought this period of frugality left a deep impression on Conan and Nagato. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so desperate to exploit Kakuzu after turning dark, showing a pathological desire for money. As they spoke, they arrived at a steel gate. This is the place. On the way, I sent a message to the leader. They're waiting inside. They. Yudo's tone and expression were like a professional actor's, showing just the right amount of surprise and curiosity. Yes, officially, our Akatsuki has only one leader, but in truth, all three are worthy of our loyalty. Takeda pushed open the steel door, and he and Keru entered first, followed by Yudo without hesitation. Inside stood three young people. The leader had orange hair, a tall build, and a handsome face, looking like a forthright person. Next was a young woman with purple hair, very beautiful but with a cold expression, and a paper flower in her hair. The last was a red-haired guy with his head down, long bangs covering most of his face. One could only see his pale skin, nose, and lips. Yahiko, Conan, and Nagato. So young, they look only about four or five years older than me. Yudo thought, calmly observing them. Leader. Takeda, supported by Keru, walked over to Yahiko and said, This is the shinobi from Kanoha, he. Yudo removed his dark goggles, revealing his pure white eyes. I'm Yudo Hyuga. Oh, a member of the Hyuga clan? This is my first time seeing these eyes up close, Yahiko smiled. Thank you for trusting us. Even here in Amigekure, many shinobi refer to the Akatsuki as rats. Rats don't protect civilians. 
I've seen Takashi-san's actions. He's a responsible and brave shinobi. Yudo said with a small smile. Ha ha wa. Takeda laughed foolishly, once again receiving a harsh pinch from his subordinate. After inspecting Takeda and Keiru's injuries, Yahiko sent them for treatment. In the large steel room, only the Amigekure trio and Yudo remained. When interacting with outsiders, Yahiko usually took the lead. He cleared his throat and smiled. Yudo Hyuga, I know you, a genius of the Hyuga branch family, the Hyuga's jewel, and a disciple of Kanoha's Tsunadeheim. Yudo's expression remained calm. It had been three months since he apprenticed under Tsunade. If the Akatsuki didn't know this information by now, it would mean Conan was utterly useless, doing nothing but wasting resources. I didn't expect Takeda to encounter you, such good fortune. Yahiko paused, then said solemnly, Yuto-kun, I would like you to deliver a letter to one of the Sanin in Kanoha. As expected, it was about Jiraiya. Yudo's mind raced, but his face remained calm. Who might it be? he asked. The Toad Sage. Oh, Jiraiya-sama. Yudo spoke softly. I am a shinobi of Kanoha. I need to know the purpose of your message. This statement was flawless. If Yahiko and his companions had formally submitted a letter, it would have definitely reached Jiraiya. But they entrusted a Kanoha shinobi, clearly not wanting outsiders to know. As a Kanoha shinobi, Yudo had every reason to ask. Yahiko nodded and said what he had prepared. The three of us spent some time with Jiraiya-sama. We are old friends. How can you prove it? I can't deliver a letter of unknown origin to Jiraiya-sama. Don't worry, we won't make it difficult for you. Yahiko smiled. Just pass on a message for us. I believe you have a technique to communicate quickly with Kanoha. Once Jiraiya-sama responds, you can safely deliver the letter. Let's hear it. The message is, the frog's board has been flipped. Yahiko's smile was warm and nostalgic. Rest assured, we are friends of Jiraiya-sama. The frog's board was a secret code shared between Jiraiya and the three from Amigekure. Only they knew it. All right, I will use a summoning technique to send this message back to Kanoha. Thank you. This is very important. It's nothing. I'm on vacation anyway. As a token of our appreciation, Yudo Kuen, we won't let you work for free. Yahiko, who had formed the Akatsuki over the years, now possessed the demeanor and skill of a leader. He stepped forward, facing Yudo directly, and asked seriously, What would you like, Yudo Kuren? We will try our best within our capabilities. Hmm. Yudo turned his head, glancing at the indifferent Conan, then at the quietly standing Nagato. Do you have money? Conan's beautiful eyes narrowed. As the person in charge of Akatsuki's intelligence and finances, she was now a complete miser, preferring to risk her life rather than spend money. For someone like yourself, money isn't important. Offering money as a reward is disrespectful. Conan's voice was cold, but her words were elegant, suggesting she had experienced many hardships over the years. Looks like I'll have to continue saving money for the base, Yudo thought to himself. He changed his request. Do you have someone proficient in chakra nature transformation? I have a technique that I haven't been able to complete. Yahiko's eyes lit up, of course. Nagato. Standing at the back, Nagato spoke gently. I understand, Yudo-kun. I will guide you. You. Although Yudo knew Nagato was a genius with the Rinnegan like the Sage of Six Paths, mastering six types of chakra nature transformations, he still had to pretend he didn't know, you don't look much older than me, can you really do it? Trust him, Yudo Kuen. Yahiko's tone was full of undisguised pride, my brother, Nagato, is the most talented shinobi I've ever met. Alright, I believe the leader of Akatsuki wouldn't deceive me. Yudo yawned, while waiting for Jiraiya-sama's response, I, stay here, Yudo Kuen, we'll find you a room and Nagato can conveniently guide you. A few minutes later, Keiru led Yudo out. The three from Amigekure remained, showing no intention of leaving. Yudo Hyuga, 
Sunade Haim's disciple. Yahiko mused on the recent conversation, if everyone was so willing to communicate, the world wouldn't have so many tragedies and conflicts. But Yahiko, Conan spoke, isn't he trusting us a bit too much? He followed Takeda in without hesitation. Would a Hyuga genius be so unguarded? He, Tsunade Haim's disciple, knowing about us isn't strange. His sensei has met us and might have mentioned it. Yahiko turned, touched Conan's face and gently pinched it, laughing, don't overthink it. It's too tiring. Human relationships shouldn't be so complicated. Humph. Conan pouted, her cheeks turning red, but she wasn't angry. Nagato crossed his arms and smiled, watching them in amusement, remaining silent. He was a professional bystander. All right, you. Conan cleared her throat and sighed. Do we really need to find Jiria Sensei? Won't it trouble him? We're just seeking advice. Our current situation is unprecedented, and we need an experienced senior's guidance. Yahiko's expression turned serious. Akatsuki is growing larger and more complex. A small squad could all be spies from other nations. This is very detrimental to us. Conan and Nagato also sighed, feeling helpless about their current predicament. Amige Cure, situated in a strategic location, was always chaotic and violent. As Akatsuki grew, Yahiko and his companions realized their actions were often known in advance, not only by Hanzo of the Salamander in Amage Cure, but also by the five great shinobi villages. Their intelligence was severely compromised, a fatal issue for an organization striving for peace in the shinobi world. No one wanted to be stabbed in the back by their own people during an operation. Yahiko, despite his dreams, understood the gravity of the situation. However, despite several purges, they had only caught a few spies with no significant improvement. For instance, today, the fourth-ranked member of Akatsuki, Takeda Takashi, was ambushed by a dozen bounty station assassins. The top-level member's action and route was completely exposed. Who wouldn't suspect foul play? External enemies were undoubtedly dangerous, but the traitors within were the real threat to Akatsuki's survival. In Akatsuki's steel underground base, Keru settled Yudo in and hurried back to her room. She was the most trusted subordinate of Takeda Takashi, Akatsuki's fourth-ranked member, acting as his assistant, bodyguard, and secretary. With Takeda's assassination attempt and the top-level action route exposed, Keru had to analyze and report to Yahiko by morning, identifying the most likely leaker. Of course, this was just a small part of her heavy workload. After brewing a cup of hot tea and drinking it all at once, Keru took out a scroll and began writing with special ink. To Danzo-sama, the plan to leak Takeda Takashi's information was successful. However, today, Yudo Hyuga appeared in Amige Cure, possibly sent by Tsunade Senju. Yudo reached out, grabbed the clothes hanging on the hook, and felt them with a frown. Damn weather in Amige Cure. I've been trying to dry these clothes for two days, and they're still damp. Although he didn't know any fire techniques, as a shinobi, drying clothes was a simple task. If all else failed, he could use a series of gentle fist techniques in front of the wet clothes, and the force from his punches would dry them. However, Yudo was a rather old-fashioned person in some respect. Even after being transmigrated to the Naruto world, he believed that clothes must be air-dried naturally. With no other choice, Yudo hung the clothes back up and changed into a uniform, dark blue with a high collar, the current standard attire of the Akatsuki. I'll just wear these for a while. Walking around Amige Cure in Kanoha-style clothes is too conspicuous. He pushed open the door and left his room, just in time to bump into his neighbor, Takeda Takashi. Yuto Kun. Takeda looked him over. This outfit really suits you. As expected, a handsome guy like you will look good in anything. Yudo smiled. Takashi-san, could you arrange for someone to send me a few more sets of clothes? I train every day, and I need to change and wash them frequently. Huh? We should have a drying vent here. It's powered by fire techniques through the ducts. 
I prefer natural drying. Sorry for the trouble, Takeda-san. All right. Takeda shrug. The Akatsuki could certainly afford a few sets of clothes. Yudo Kuen, don't think I'm nagging, but air drying in this damp climate can cause mold. Oh you can ask Keru for some seeds. Put them in your clothes to avoid any strange smells. Takeda was the fourth in command of the Akatsuki. Unlike the top three leaders, he had a somewhat motherly nature, constantly chatting and unable to stop once he started. Keru loves collecting seeds. Even after a battle, when she's barely alive on the ground, she'll pick a pretty flower bud to take home and make into a beautiful tree. Yudo smiled and took out a yellow seed. You and Keru-san think alike. She gave me a jar of these a few days ago. They're great for removing odors. Oh? Haha ha, you see I've known Keru for many years. Whether in battle or elsewhere we have great chemistry. That's the kind of friendship forged through life and death haha. Ha. Just friends. Yudo suddenly felt mischievous and started teasing the straightforward man. Actually, I've wanted to say this for a long time. You and Keru-san make a good couple. She's the only subordinate daring enough to pinch her superior's waist. Are you two secretly dating? And don't talk nonsense, you'll give people the wrong idea. Takeda, the Akatsuki's fourth in command, a seasoned jonin who had weathered many storms, blushed and hurriedly looked around before scurrying away like he was fleeing. As he left, he muttered, what couple, what secret relationship? Ridiculous. Humph. Watching Takeda flee, Yudo shook his head and continued walking. Honestly, in the Naruto world, most men and women were quite innocent. Love was for a lifetime, and there was no such thing as falling out of love. He navigated through various corridors and secret rooms to a spacious training ground. In the center of the training ground, a red-haired young man sat cross-legged, head bowed, as calm as a still lake. Yudo took a deep breath and stretched his hands. Today was his tenth day in Amage Cure. Nagato was a very trustworthy and responsible person. When he said he'd help Yudo develop new techniques, he meant it. He spent most of his time helping Yudo with moves and researching technique. Of course, this was also related to Nagato's position in the Akatsuki. Yahiko was the apparent leader, Conan handled logistics and intelligence, and Nagato didn't manage specific tasks, only appearing in battles. Besides training, he had little else to do. I'm starting, Nagato-san. Yudo muttered quietly, his body tensing. The steel floor beneath him instantly formed a shallow pit. Boom. Thunderous boom filled the training ground as Yudo instantly dashed to Nagato's side. He raised his right hand, but not in the familiar gentle fist stance known in the shinobi world. A human-sized armor enveloped Yudo's right hand, resembling flowing water and dancing wind. This armor looked like a beast's mouth, with terrifyingly sharp fangs corresponding to Yudo's fingers. Lion's Fong strike. Yudo struck Nagato's chest with his right hand. The sharp explosion echoed loudly, the impact powerful enough to shatter a house-sized boulder. Nagato's half-closed eyes snapped open. His deep purple eyes with concentric circles were mysterious, powerful, and majestic. Buzz. Yudo's lion's fong stopped 15 centimeters from Nagato's skin, halted by an immense repulsive force, unable to move any further. Bang. Nagato clapped his hands lightly, sending Yudo flying. He crashed into a wall 50 meters away, dust and debris flying as the steel and concrete were crushed. The young man from the branch family was embedded in the wall, gasping for breath. Very good, Yudo-kun. Nagato stood up and walked to Yudo, his tone full of praise. You lasted 0.4 seconds longer than yesterday. I understand why Tsunadeheim took you as her student. Yudo-kun, you have exceptional talent. One day, you'll become an extraordinary shinobi. To those who don't know, it might sound like you're mocking me. No, Yudo Kuen, 0.4 seconds of improvement is truly excellent. Nagato pulled Yudo up and carefully examined his hand, sighing. This technique has great offensive power but causes significant strain on your body. 
Look, your muscles are already torn. It's okay. I know medical techniques, and my sensei and I will refine this technique to reduce the damage to my body. For now, I need to maximize its power. Alright. Since Tsunadeheim will handle the final adjustments, we can focus on increasing its power without worry. Nagato nodded. Let's continue. Your lion's fong bite is based on gentle fist, chakra enhanced strength, and chakra emission. The chakra armor incorporates wind and water techniques, which is a brilliant idea. Flowing means power, and the violent water and wind are as strong as steel. But I think this technique isn't perfect yet. We can use the principles of wind and water techniques, so why not try adding more elements? I thought about it a lot last night, Yudokuen. Today, let's try incorporating earth techniques. Look, this is earth release. Tearing earth turning palm. We can imitate this chakra manipulation method. The days in Amage Cure passed one after another. Yudo was having a good time. Now, at the beginning of the 56th year of Kanoha, the three members of Amage Cure were still undeniably good people, and the Akatsuki organization aimed for world peace. Living here, aside from the inconvenience of drying clothes after washing, was surprisingly comfortable. Having stayed in Amage Cure for nearly a month, Yudo had become accustomed to the continuous rain and even found rainy days tolerable, as they at least kept things cool. One day, after finishing his strenuous training, he returned to his room. The small room was filled with a quiet floral fragrance. The seeds given by Keiru were excellent, and whatever method was used to create them, the fragrance was long-lasting. Lying in bed, he felt a refreshing sense of being in the wilderness. Yudo's appearance had changed somewhat since he arrived. His hands and arms were wrapped in layers of bandages. If the bandages were removed, one could see dense, unhealed scars on his skin. The lion's fong bite technique was almost complete. Based on Yudo's understanding of chakra and kenjutsu, with guidance from Minato and further research by Nagato, this technique had incorporated various ninjutsu concepts, increasing its power tremendously, though it also inflicted damage on the user's body. Now, Tsunade had to finalize the improvements to reduce or eliminate the backlash on the user for the technique to be considered complete. Undoubtedly, this technique was truly an S-rank in terms of both power and training difficulty. This trip to the Land of Rain had yielded greater results than expected. Yudo originally planned to continue building his base by collecting heads but unexpectedly got the opportunity to complete the lion's fong bite. Just as he lay down on his bed, a strange feeling suddenly came over him. Yudo squinted, sat up straight, and looked at his bandaged hands with a frown, smiling wryly. He had no choice but to bite his tongue and use the tongue blood to perform the summoning technique luxuriously. With a puff of smoke, Katsuyu appeared. Yuto Kuen, uh, what happened to your hands? Nothing, just some after effects of training. I'll be fine with some rest, Yuto said respectfully. Lady Katsuyu, do you have any news from Jiraiya sama? Yes, he asked Tsunade sama to send back a message. Ha, 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 those three kids have grown up. You can leave their letter with me. That's what Jiraiya sama said. Thank you, and sorry for the trouble, Lady Katsuyu. Wait a moment. Katsuyu's gentle voice had a hint of schadenfreude. Lady Tsunade said you've been out for a month and a half, and she almost forgot she has a male student. Uh. Yudo scratched his head apologetically. I'm really sorry to my sensei. I got so absorbed in developing ninjutsu that I lost track of time. I'll return soon with Jiraiya-sama's letter. As he spoke, he took out a small box from under the bed. This is a collection of small trinkets I gathered in Amage Cure. I hope my sensei likes them, they are handy items, because they can fetch a good price if needed. He emphasized the last few words. Yudo, you are indeed a very filial child. Katsuyu sincerely praised, swallowing the valuable box and disappearing with a puff. In the room, Yudo rubbed his shoulders, got up, took off his high-collar cloak, changed into Kanoha-style shinobi attire, and walked out the door. 
He was already quite familiar with the base and soon arrived outside Yahiko's room. After knocking and receiving a response, Yudo pushed the door open and entered. The moment he stepped in, his heart skipped a beat. As a double agent for Kanoha, Yudo always required himself to stay sharp. Upon entering, he immediately sensed that the atmosphere in the room was off. Yahiko and Conan's faces were dark as if dripping water, and Nagato was no longer as calm as usual. He seemed like a tsunami about to erupt. Ah, Yuto kun Yahiko forced a smile. Is there something you need? Jiraiya-sama replied to me. He indeed has a deep connection with you three, so I can take your letter. This is one of the few good things today, Yahiko sighed. Nagato, please hand the letter to Yuto kun later. Yudo blinked. By the way, there's one more thing. I've been here for almost a month, and since Jiryazama has agreed, I should be taking my leave. No need to rush, Nagato suddenly said. Over the past few weeks, he had grown closer to Yudo and used more intimate terms. Yudo, your technique still lacks something. I was thinking of perfecting it. Give me one or two days, and once it's done, you can leave. Yudo thought for a moment and agreed. He knew the three of them had something to discuss, so he tactfully yawned and left the room. The atmosphere inside the room grew tense again. After a long silence, Yahiko said softly, Conan, bring Takeda here. A paper crane flew out and shortly after, the door opened again. Leader, Takeda Takashi stood respectfully. Yahiko's expression was somewhat dazed. This subordinate had always been the most reliable, always at the front line in battles, sincere, and responsible. From the establishment of Akatsuki until now, how many troubles had he solved for himself? During thunderstorms, Takeda would suffer unbearable headaches, a hidden injury from taking a blade for him back then. The handsome and bold young man felt reluctant and closed his eyes, unsure how to speak. Conan, being more decisive, saw Yahiko's hesitation and decided to be direct. Takeda, a month ago, we identified the spy who leaked your route. It was Keiru Asano. She's from Kanoha. Takeda's breath hitched, struck by lightning. Kunensat. This past month, I investigated many places in secret, working with Yahiko for covert operations. After multiple tests, we confirmed it was Keiru Asano. Takeda, I know you. Conan paused, then revealed everything. Keiru Asano is now the person you trust the most, and you have a close relationship. Your subordinates are practically her subordinates. And more importantly, I intercepted a message by chance. Takeda, an assassination plot against you is about to commence. If you die in the assassination, Keiru Asano will take your place. This is too dangerous. We must act first, Takeda. Impossible. Takeda, silent for a long time, suddenly spoke. He only said a few words and then stood in a daze again. What was impossible? Keru couldn't be a spy? Or Keru couldn't really kill you? Conan pondered this and looked at Yahiko. The final decision still lay with Yahiko. Handle it yourself. As long as it doesn't harm the organization, I'll approve of your actions, Yahiko said softly making the biggest concession possible after some deliberation. Either banish Keiru Asano from the Land of Rain, or we kill her ourselves. There's no third choice. I'm sorry, Takeda. Say your goodbyes to Keiru Asano. But remember, don't hesitate. After all, she's the woman who wants to kill you. Keiru Asano held a stone pestle, forcefully grinding seeds. Copper-colored oil slowly seeped out with the Kunoichi's efforts. From twenty seeds, only a thin strand of hair-like oil was extracted. Keru carefully collected it, surprisingly accumulating half a bowl. Knock, knock, knock. The knocking on the door had a familiar rhythm, instantly revealing who was outside. Come in, the door's not locked. With a creak, Takeda Takashi entered the room and locked the door behind him. Without turning around, Keru continued to press the oil from the seeds. Captain, Entering a female subordinate's room in the middle of the night is quite impolite, you know. Ah, uh, Takeda mumbled, trying to maintain a normal tone. What are you doing? 
Extracting oil. You've always been fond of various plant seeds, but it's the first time I've seen you interested in oil. These are a black palm seeds. They're not pretty and have no fragrance, but their oil is very useful. If it is applied to metal, it prevents rust. Takeda paused, touching the chakra short sword on his back. For me. For the pig. Unconsciously, the man's lips curled slightly. The coldness he had mustered before entering the room dissipated. After a moment of silence, he spoke softly. Come with me. Keiru put down the pestle, stood up, and followed Takeda without the slightest hesitation, showing no sign of being an infiltrator. They walked for a long time, leaving the Akatsuki base, leaving the underground, and reaching the surface, disappearing into the endless rain, moving farther away. Finally, they stopped at the edge of Amage Cure. Takeda turned to look at Keru's delicate face, calmly saying, Kanoha Shinobi, Keru Asano, nice to meet you. The Kunoichi remained silent, neither refuting nor responding. I thought you would run away. Takeda frowned, having deliberately brought Keru here, implying she could leave the village without obstruction. Keru just stared, rain soaking her hair, black strands sticking to her fair cheeks like fragile porcelain. Where would I run to? The three leaders are all very powerful. This is the edge of Amage Cure. The leaders wouldn't chase you to the land of fire for you. My mission isn't complete yet. Even if I return to Kanoha, it wouldn't be pleasant. Mission, mission. A surge of anger suddenly welled up. Takeda stepped forward, grabbing Keiru's shoulders, nearly digging his nails into her skin. Your mission was to design my assassination, then replace me as the organization's fourth member, right? You. Even disregarding your own life, you would complete the mission and kill me. Takeda hesitated for a long time, not daring to voice this thought. He feared Keiru would affirm it, making his actions today seem utterly foolish. A mission. Keru ambiguously responded, looking aside. The sky over Amage Cure was always an awe-inspiring leaden gray. During the day it was manageable, but at night, looking up revealed an endless black, like a deep pool. Entering Amage Cure felt like falling into an abyss, a place one could never leave. The Kunoichi thought softly, stop saying such childish things. Takeda, no longer addressing him as captain, she stared into his eyes. Who do you think we are? We are shinobi. Killing, gathering intelligence, waging wars. We can do many things, but mercy for enemies isn't one of them. You think sparing me would make me grateful? No, Takeda, I'd only mock your weakness. The land of fire and the other great nations have waged wars here for years. Many people from Amage Cure died at Kanoha's hands, and vice versa, Amage Cure caused great harm to Kanoha forces. I am a Kanoha Shinobi, and you are a high-ranking member of Amage Cure's Akatsuki. No matter how well we get along, it's an illusion. When they know I'm a spy, only one of us will live. Generational blood feuds. Hatred is the greatest bond between people in our world. Keru felt the grip on her shoulders weaken. I've heard him, she thought feeling bitter yet miraculously unafraid. Dying at Takeda's hands was a fate she could accept. The pressure on her shoulders disappeared, and suddenly, something was placed in her hands. She looked at it, confused. This is? A shell. Takeda's voice was gentle, as if trying to dispel the gloomy weather. I've never been to the seaside, have you? I haven't either. But what's the connection to our situation? Takeda wiped the water from her face, speaking softly. In a faraway place, there's a country called the Land of the Sea. It's even farther from the world's center than the Land of Water, composed of islands with few people and reportedly no shinobi. Chakra didn't favor that land. But it's a wonderful place. I've heard from travelers that in the Land of the Sea, the sunlight turns the beaches golden, reflecting off the sky, making the clouds look like golden palaces. At the tops of giant straight trees, there are strange fruits, hard as iron on the outside, but filled with sweet juice inside. There are no shinobi, no wars, 
only houses in the mountains and by the sea, and people living happily. He paused, lowering his voice. Let's go to the land of the sea, together. The woman suddenly felt lost, even though she had become an excellent shinobi. At this moment, she was as flustered as a little girl caught stealing candy by her mother years ago. Many years had passed, her mother and father were long gone, but now, the man before her wanted to give her a new blue sky. Takeda opened his arms, embracing her. The rainy night was no longer cold. Let's leave together, away from the shinobi nations to the land of the sea. We've done too much over the years. We owe nothing to the organization, and you owe nothing to Kanoha. I have enough connections to ensure our safe departure, but preparing the safe route will take time. Give me a day. Tomorrow, at midnight, I'll wait for you under the red sign at the base's sixth exit. We'll leave together, to the land of the sea, to the place where the beach is full of shining white shells. Keiru, give me a chance and give yourself a chance, okay? In the dark rainy night, after an unknown time, the woman closed her eyes, nodding, and hugged the man's waist. Her voice trembled, as if embarking on a grand escape. And the next day, the offensive part of this technique is now complete. Yudo, in the spacious training ground, Nagato Uzumaki massaged his sore arms as he emerged from the pile of rubble, slowly standing up straight. In front of him were two deep trenches, each nearly a hundred meters long. These were the marks left by his feet after being forced back by a tremendous force. Even though he used the special Rinnegan technique, Shinra Tensei, to block the attack, he couldn't dissipate the immense impact force. Lion's Fong Bite, a technique powerful enough to make its user famous in the shinobi world. Yudo panted heavily, his hands once again covered in blood. Thank you. Are your hands okay? Every bone in my hands is nearly broken. Fortunately, I know medical ninjutsu. Yudo was relieved. After completing Lion's Fong Bite, the burden on his body had increased several times. Although the power was immense, it had shattered his bones. I'm leaving today. I've been away from the village for too long. If I stay any longer, it won't be justifiable. While using the palm healing technique to heal his body, Yudo spoke to Nagato, until my sensei finds a way to reduce the backlash of this technique, I must limit its use. With the current version of Lion's Fong, using it three times in a row will tear my own arms apart. Great power comes at a great cost. Nagato sighed, we shinobi are, after all, just a bunch of unfortunate people, strong because of chakra and dead because of it. Yudo laughed, overthinking is not a good thing. Nagato, I'm leaving. All right. Hopefully, the next time we meet, we won't be enemies. If it happens, so be it. Shinobi can never choose their fate. The Branch family youth returned to his house, tidied up the room, and packed his belongings. However, he did not leave immediately but continued to use medical ninjutsu to heal his body inside the house. While traveling outside, his physical state had to be adjusted to at least the level where he could fight against shinobi of the same rank. As night fell, the land continued to be covered in incessant rain. Outside the base, Keiru Asano was grinding seeds. The oil for feeding the blade was time-consuming to make, with many steps that couldn't be replaced by ninjutsu, only by ancient craftsmanship. To make the blade oil for Takeda Takashi's flying wing, Keiru had been secretly working hard for two months. Before leaving, she wanted to finish this task. Black palm flowers might not exist in the land of sea. As a spy for Kanoha, Keiru, who was about to escape from the land of rain, couldn't pack her luggage openly like Yudo. Yahiko had let Takeda handle Keiru himself, as long as it didn't endanger the organization, he wouldn't interfere. Running away with a female spy, wouldn't severely harm Akatsuki, and could be seen as a somewhat acceptable way to handle things. But sneaking away was one thing, making it widely known was another. Takeda and Keiru couldn't overdo it and embarrass Yahiko and the others. Helping others is helping oneself. More importantly, Keiru knew she had to be in this house at this hour today. 
Not being there or being at the wrong time could lead to severe consequences, because today was the day she had agreed to meet her superior. Squeak. After a while, the door opened. The footsteps were rhythmic, signaling a secret code. Yami. The man who entered closed the door and spoke Kaira's code name in the root. Al Sama. The female shinobi put down the pestle, turned, and knelt on one knee, head bowed low. The incessant rain of Amige Cure is always so disturbing. Owl, wearing a bird-faced mask, covered his face tightly. His black robe wrapped him securely, revealing only his muscular outline. Yami, do you have anything to say about Takeda Takeshi? Kaira's heart felt like it was gripped by a hand, making her almost unable to breathe due to the tension. Fortunately, after her parents' deaths and being sent into the root, Kaira had overcome countless crises and wasn't about to break under a casual probe. With a momentary closing of her eyes, the female shinobi suppressed her tension and fear, and calmly said, the assassination plan against Takeda Takashi will take place five days later. At that time, he will be escorting a wealthy merchant from the land of rain out of Amigekure, far from Akatsuki's base. It's the best time for us to act. I've heard that your relationship with Takeda Takashi is good, Yami. Are you wavering now? Keru sighed inwardly. She knew very well what heard meant. Apart from her, there were obviously other Konoha spies in Akatsuki. The female shinobi raised her head, her beautiful eyes cold and indifferent. Owl reached out, pinched Kaira's chin, forcing her to look at him. His fingers dug into her fair skin without mercy. After a moment, he released her, satisfied. Root needed and favored subordinates without excessive emotions, focused solely on their missions. Tell me, Yami, what level of power is needed to assassinate Takeda Takashi? He's proficient in water release, and the most noteworthy are the two chakra blades, Flying Wing. Apart from that, he's just an ordinary special jonin. Then I'll give you four teammates. With you, that makes five. It should be enough, if necessary, I will also take action. Kiru replied calmly, No need, Alsama. If it's a sneak attack, I can do it alone. Takeda Takashi trusts me very much. Good, you are fully responsible for this assassination. I will temporarily leave the Land of Rain to handle other matters. Keru felt a weight lifted off her chest. She instinctively wanted to keep Al away from her, knowing he was a dangerous man. Decoy, post-operation explanations, your promotion. Heh, forget it, there's no need to say more, Yami. You are already an excellent shinobi. Al glanced around the room. The discarded boxes were filled with seeds of the black palm flower, squeezed dry of oil. Very good. A spy must fully integrate into their role. Once the matter with Akatsuki is wrapped up, Danzo-sama will assign you more important tasks. As his words fell, he disappeared. One minute, two minutes, five minutes. Keru remained kneeling on one knee, unmoving. After an indeterminate amount of time, she suddenly collapsed to the ground. Finally, the last hurdle is over. Owl, a terrifying man, you surely don't know that this was our last meeting in this life. Keru sat on the floor for a long while. After her tense nerves fully relaxed, she stood up and opened the window. Outside it was still raining. The towering steel buildings pierced the night sky like deep wells rising from the ground. Oppressive, gloomy, and chaotic, such was always the nature of Amige Cure, unchanged. However, at this moment, the female shinobi breathed in the air desperately, greedily swallowing the rainwater that drifted into her mouth. This was the taste of freedom. Takeda Takashi opened the door. When passing by Yudo's room, he hesitated for a moment but decided not to knock and say goodbye. His departure was defection, so it was better not to disturb unrelated people. With this thought, Takeda left directly. However, after only walking a few meters, a paper crane folded from white paper landed on his shoulder. Takeda was very familiar with the chakra fluctuations within the paper crane and understood what it meant. He threw the crane into the air, and it fluttered under the control of distant chakra. 
Takeda followed it. The paper crane stopped in front of a door. Takeda knocked, and after receiving a response, he entered. Leader, Konan-sama, Nagato-sama. Takeda bowed respectfully, as always. Takeda, Yahiko spoke, his handsome face expressionless. You're leaving? Yes, leader. Where to? A far, far away place, a peaceful spot away from the world's center. Ah, you really dare to say that? Yahiko shook his head. As the fourth-ranking member, leaving the Land of Rain with the organization's secrets and a Kanoha spy. Takeda, have you thought this through? Sorry, leader-sama. Takeda Takashi lowered his head, instinctively gripping the two sharp chakra short swords, wing blades. The small secret room became as quiet as a grave in an instant. It seems as a shinobi, you have chosen and accepted your fate, Yahiko said calmly, closing his eyes. Conan, the purple-haired ice queen silently walked towards Takeda. Takeda felt his heartbeat quicken, his grip on wing blades tightening. However, he remained where he stood, head down, without fleeing or resisting. Conan placed her hand on Takeda's shoulder. His hand felt heavier. Something had been added, very heavy, almost straining his back. Takeda, Conan's lips curved up, like an ice mountain melting, bringing spring warmth. Eloping with a girl, you can't let her suffer. Takeda looked down at the large package in his hands. It contained precious metals, intricate machinery, and rare medicines, items that could be exchanged for a large amount of local currency anywhere. Konan-sama. Takeda's nose suddenly felt sour. This man in his thirties almost cried on the spot. You have worked hard for the organization all these years, bearing many scars and almost dying in battles several times. We've seen it and never forgot. Conan, who was in charge of Akatsuki's intelligence, finances, and logistics, was usually stingy, but she was generous when it mattered most. You said you were going to a remote place far from the world center. I can guess where. In a place lacking or devoid of chakra, money is always the most practical. Take it. I know you and Kara have no savings, one buys swords, the other buys seeds, truly a perfect match. Takeda looked up to see Yahiko's encouraging eyes and Nagato's light smile. These are the leaders I've served for these years. I've never regretted it. Biting his lip, the man bowed deeply, holding the package, and slowly exited the room. Just before closing the door, Takeda took a deep breath and shouted, Leader, your wishes will come true. One day, peace will come to the world through Akatsuki's efforts. I will wait for that day, even if far away. Laughter from the three young leaders echoed from the room until the door was completely closed, coming in openly, leaving with dignity. Takeda's years in Akatsuki ended perfectly. The man wiped his face, turned around, and headed straight to the base's sixth exit. He could now head towards happiness without any psychological burden. Keiru didn't use an umbrella, letting the rain wet her face. At 25, she was no longer a little girl, but tonight, in this rainy evening, she walked down the street, hopping around, petting small cats and dogs. The kunoichi, like a child, observed and enjoyed the world. Everything seemed different, more beautiful, and meaningful. She soon arrived under the red signpost. The signpost was crimson and very tall, visible from afar. In Amage Cure, it was a small landmark. Locals knew the exact location once mentioned. Keiru stood under the red signpost, looking around, unable to control her smile. She needed to wait because she had arrived too early. The agreed time with Takeda was midnight, but it was only 10 o'clock, two hours too early. Thinking about it, her cheeks blushed. She touched her face, which was indeed hot. Oh dear. I came so early. Two whole hours. If Takeda sees this, he'll surely laugh at me. It's not that I'm eager to elope with you. I, I just... Under the signpost, Keru giggled to herself. I just wanted to see you sooner. Suddenly, her fingertips touched her pocket. Mm. Keru frowned, searching carefully but finding nothing. The bottle of blade oil she had prepared for two months was left at the base's residence. The kunoichi bit her lip. 
Takeda loved his blades. In the land of waves, where there was no chakra, the only memory of the past would be those two sharp wing blades. The land of waves probably doesn't have good black camellia. Thinking this, she calculated the time. Returning to the base residence and back here would take at most half an hour. Going back to get the blade oil and returning to wait by the signpost, there would still be a very ample hour and a half before the appointed time. By then, Takeda might not have even arrived. <laughs> Annoying guy, making me go back for something. Keru stroked the shell Takeda gave her, turned, and walked into the alley, heading back. Without a hint of displeasure. Ah, uh, did I come too early? Takeda emerged from the base's sixth exit, looking up to see the red signpost, but no one was there. Indeed, too early. Two hours until midnight. He sighed lightly, walked over slowly, and leaned against the signpost, gazing at the sky. He was still holding the heavy package. Take some money to buy a large yard by the beach in the land of waves. He thought, feeling a sense of unprecedented fulfillment. Buy lots of flowers and plants for Keru, oh, and seeds. The fate of a shinobi is a broken balance. Effort and reward, happiness and disaster, will never be equal. For two people from opposing factions to fall in love took three whole years, over a thousand days and nights together, 115 battles fought side by side, 34 nights of intimate talks, 16 times of narrowly escaping death with laughter and embrace, and one declaration of love on a rainy night. However, under the crimson signpost, for two lovers to narrowly miss each other forever, it only took six seconds. With a splash, Keiru Asano's foot stepped into a puddle, soaking the hem of her pants. What bad luck, she thought, frowning slightly. She hurriedly entered the house, pushing the door open and stepping inside. The moment she entered, her body went rigid with terror. A tall man stood silently in the center of the room. His muscular form was concealed beneath a black robe, and a bird-like mask gave him a menacing appearance. It was Owl. You've become too careless, Yami, Owl said slowly. Normally, you would have noticed the bent grass in the yard and had more time to escape. Maybe you could have survived a bit longer. Owl Sama, Keru swallowed hard, not daring to kneel as she usually would. She couldn't afford to slow herself down. But how had he seen through her? Owl shook his head, staring at his subordinate. After all this time, you finally slipped up. When you hurriedly tried to get me to leave Amage Cure, it raised my suspicion. Why did you want me gone? I guessed you were hiding something. Just because of that? Keru asked bitterly. Anyone with a single suspicious trait is likely guilty of much more. You know how I earned the name Owl. Owl, a member of Root, was infamous for his ruthless and bloody reputation. In his eyes, there was no room for punishment, only execution. Keru gritted her teeth, knowing the man before her had made up his mind. She coldly retorted, Owl, haven't you thought that one day Danzo-sama might kill you? Even within Root, many want you dead for your excessive killing. You're wrong, Yami. I won't die, Owl replied. To Danzo-sama, I am a tool. As long as I get the job done, it doesn't matter how many I kill. You, on the other hand, are a disposable asset. Easily replaceable. A tool. Humph, Owl, have you forgotten? The first Hokage created the village to prevent shinobi from becoming mere tools of war. The first Hokage was a great shinobi, but he couldn't change the world's true nature, Owl said, pointing at himself and then at Keru. I am Danza-sama's tool. You are my tool. And Yudo Hyuga is a tool for both the third Hokage and the Hyuga clan. You deceived me to leave Amage Cure. Yudo Hyuga has been hiding here for a month. Tools rebelling against their masters is a grave crime. A tool must fulfill its duties and stay on its path. Any deviation means it is no longer a proper tool. Luckily, I'm here. I'll dispose of you and report everything Yudo Hyuga has done to Danzo-sama. Suspected of amassing wealth, being deeply involved with the Akatsuki, developing powerful new jutsu, the information you provided this month has been very detailed, Yami. Bang. 
Before Owl could finish, Keiru smashed through the window, her feet barely touching the ground before her chakra exploded, leaving a shallow crater as she sped away. Run, run. She had to escape. Her inner voice screamed. She covered ten meters in a blink, but her vision blurred and her throat burned. Strength drained from her limbs like a broken dam. Owl appeared before her. Blood dripped from his hand, which held a chunk of her throat. I told you, tonight you're too careless and hasty. You didn't even notice my feigned lapse. As a tool, you only amounted to this. With a crash, Kaira's body hit the wall, her bones snapping. Tool, disposed of, Owl muttered, crouching beside her as she took her last breaths. Uh. Owl pried open Kaira's hand, finding a seashell. A seashell, clutching it even in death. Takeda couldn't remember how many times he'd checked the time. It was now past midnight. At first he thought, women always late, and patiently waited. But as time slipped by, anxiety gnawed at him. Did Keru return to Kanoha? The thought tormented him as he stood under the red signpost. Fear wrapped around him. Had something happened to Keru? He could no longer stay put. He left the signpost, desperately searching the streets for her. He knew where Kara's house outside the base was. With little hope, he decided to check there, praying for a clue. Amage Cure was deserted after midnight. Though not under curfew, the constant rain made it an uninviting place for nightlife. The streets were almost empty, save for a few open bars. These places were popular, offering warmth and a chance to escape the cold rain. Takeda ran through the chilly streets, his experience allowing him to quickly assess people. He soon stopped, frozen in place. In one of the bars, a tall man sat with his back to him. The man wore a black robe and lazily toyed with a white seashell, stained with blood. In an instant, Takeda understood. Rage erupted, obliterating his reason. Was it a trap? Should he seek help or plan an ambush? None of these thoughts registered. Before he knew it, he was charging at Owl with his wing blades drawn. Boom. The sharp chakra weapons struck the table. A shinobi losing his mind falls for such simple trick. How amusing. In the rainy night, Owl laughed maniacally. Yudo walked through the cold, rainy night, holding an umbrella. The natives of Amage Cure didn't like using umbrellas. For them, rain was normal weather and sunny days were rare. They were so accustomed to the rain that using an umbrella seemed unnecessary. Yudo, a branch family member, was in high spirits. This trip had been fruitful. He acquired wealth, established a secret base in the land of hot water, and made contact with the Akatsuki. With Nagato's help, he perfected the lion's fong bite, securing his place in the shinobi world. It was time to return to the village, he thought heading towards the edge of Amage Cure. Suddenly, his foot landed in a puddle, and Yudo noticed an unusual sticky sensation. Activating his Byakugan, he saw through his body and discovered a bloodied piece of flesh stuck to his shoe. In the vast field of his vision, a man's figure appeared. It was Takeda Takashi. He was sitting in a filthy alley, leaning against a wall. Blood and entrails seeped out of him, mixing with the accumulating rainwater and flowing towards Yudo's feet. Yudo hesitated but then walked into the alley, approaching Takeda. With just a glance using his Byakugan, Yudo sighed. Green light gathered in Yudo's palm as he performed medical ninjutsu on Takeda. After a while, Takeda slowly woke up, coughing up blood. Yudo retracted his hand and softly said, I'm sorry your internal organs are destroyed. Even if my sensei were here, they couldn't save you. You have a few minutes left. As we've been neighbors for a month, I can relay a message for you. Any last words? Takeda's voice was hoarse to the extreme. No. The person to hear my last words died before me. External chakra stimulation, coupled with a burst of energy before death, temporarily improved Takeda's condition. Ignoring his abdominal wound, his face looked normal. I see, Yudo nodded, standing calmly before Takeda. I'll watch over you as you pass. Even Shinobi feels sorrow dying alone. You're a kind person, Yudo-kun, 
Takeda murmured, hesitating. There's a sake shop with a gourd sign on the nearby street. Can you fetch me a jug? Quickly, please, I'm afraid I. I'll be back. Yudo disappeared using the body flicker technique and soon returned. He knelt down, holding the jug, and slowly poured sake into Takeda's mouth. Takeda coughed violently but breathed comfortably. Good sake. On a rainy night like this, strong liquor warms the body. Yudo glanced down. The sake barely stayed in Takeda's esophagus before flowing out. His body was severely damaged. His internal organs had fallen out and his spine was broken. Takeda was alive only due to Yudo's chakra. Impressive technique, Yudo frowned. Attacked from behind, your body opened up. A sword master like you, caught off guard. Ha, the attacker wore a birdface mask. I asked for his name. He said, Owl. Must be from Kanoha. He was really arrogant, you know. I just. I think he knew. I was alive. But he didn't care. Takashi began to mumble. His eyes growing hazy from the blood loss. One of our elite was sent to kill you. Yudo asked. Hearing his voice, Takashi's eyes refocused, and he whispered, probably to clean house. Keru, she was your spy. Yudo clicked his tongue and continued feeding Takeda sake. Slow down. This sake is strong, hmm? Takeda mumbled. My tongue feels numb. Because you're dying. Ah. Uh. Takeda slumped against the wall, death claiming his last vitality. He thought hard, then weakly said, Behind me to the right, about 200 meters, there's a package with lots of money. It's yours, for keeping me company. After these words, Takeda's body rapidly weakened. In seconds, his face darkened and his voice grew faint. Yudo barely caught his last whisper, mixed with the rain. Kaeru, I just wanted to take you somewhere nice. But why? A broken shell fell from his cold hand. In the alley, Yudo stared at Takeda's body for a long time. Things had become more complicated, he thought. Keru Asano was a spy, so close to him. She likely reported all his actions this month, killing targets outside the village. Doesn't seem like standard ANBU work. This level of secrecy and ruthlessness, could it be root? Being noticed by Danzo is bad news. Yudo sighed, knowing he had one more person to guard against upon returning to the village. Danzo Shimura, notorious for his schemes, orchestrated the ambush on the AIM orphans and Shursue Uchiha Sai theft. Should he pursue and eliminate Owl now? Yudo considered. No, Danzo might already have intel on me. This is too risky. If Owl escapes, I'd be a target and forced to defect. I'm not strong enough yet. Yudo thought deeply, covering Takeda's body with a curtain. Takeda Takashi, Keru Asano, though we're not friends, but we're alike in some ways. Most people wouldn't dare bark, but we, foolish ones, draw blades against fate. His hand paused. In the cold, rainy night, a spark of madness ignited in the young man's heart. You can't win without taking risk. He shook the sake jug, drinking it all. The intense flavor and aroma burned his throat, warming his stomach and dispelling the night's chill. His emotions surged. Something stronger than sake roared within him. Chakra swirled violently, almost like a tidal wave. Good sake. Yudo chuckled, tossing the jug aside. In the next moment, he dashed into the rain, gaining speed. The rain hitting him evaporated instantly, forming a long trail of steam, like a scorching blade. The land of rain has been plagued by continuous war, making survival without the protection of shinobi incredibly difficult. This difficulty is most evident in the desolation outside Amage Cure, with sparse towns and villages. On the rainy night plains, a tall man runs, the rain bouncing off his muscular body. He moves like a wild panther through the rain, his heart calm. After killing, Owl's mood always improves for a few days. Tonight, he killed Keru Asano and Takeda Takashi in succession. First, he found a flaw in the Kunoichi and then successfully lured the fourth member of the Akatsuki with a shell. Two consecutive feasts made Owl feel satisfied. Even in the rain, which he despises, 
Owl feels like dancing joyfully. This joy lasted until he sensed something unusual behind him. Owl suddenly stops, his strong body rooted to the ground like a nail. He turns around, squints his eyes, and slowly adjusts his breathing. Approaching rapidly is a long, smoke dragon. Owl sees clearly that it is a strange phenomenon caused by the speed, instantly vaporizing the rain. An expert and hostile, he thought. In just five seconds, the long smoke reaches him. No slowing down and no legendary, expert probing. Yudo, with steam rising from his body, crashes into Owl like a dragon's mouth. Both throw punches simultaneously. They are both highly skilled in taijutsu, and the full-force collision of their fists creates a shockwave that blows away all the rain within a hundred meters, forming a hemispherical dry zone in the dark wilderness. The next moment, they punch again, both opting for a subtle stabbing punch with the other hand. Though discreet, this is the killing move. Chakra enhanced strength, earth release, fist rock, boom. This impact is even fiercer. The ground around them sinks in, plants are uprooted, and rocks are thrown into the air. Skilled in earth release and a secret technique to increase strength. Yudo staggers, once again suffering from his not fully developed body. However, he has plenty of experience fighting adult. He changes from fist to palm, grabbing Owl's wrist and suddenly releasing chakra to destroy the enemy's acupuncture points and chakra pathway. Unfortunately, though Yudo is experienced, Owl is also a seasoned and terrifying killer. At the moment he saw the face of the attacker, Owl was prepared to face the gentle fist. He knew how formidable the Hyuga's gentle fist was. When Yudo grabbed his wrist, Owl went limp, lowering his body to headbutt Yudo's skull. If this hit landed, Yudo's skull would shatter. He dared not take it head on and had to let go of Owl's wrist, blocking with his arm and retreating more than 10 meters, bouncing out of the crater left by their punches. Yudo Hyuga. Owl flexed his wrist, staring directly at the branch family boy. Do you know who I am? Owl right? Probably a member of Root. Yudo rubbed his fingers lightly, speaking softly. There's no mistake. You're the one I'm looking for. Attacking a fellow village shinobi is a capital crime, Yudo Hyuga. I thought what you did in Amige Cure was merely out of a desire for power. Attacking a fellow village shinobi? You just did that yourself. Are you talking about Yami? Owl sneered, his bird face mask hiding all his expressions. Tools must be disposed off when they're broken. Even traitor like you can be used to nourish Kanoha's root. Hey stop. Yudo interrupted him with a smile. I'm really tired of your rhetoric, justifying power grabs and benefits with grandiose words. Never mind, why am I arguing with you? The branch family boy grinned. For a villain, talking too much before killing is a big taboo. Kill. Owl almost laughed at these words. In their brief exchange, Owl had already gauged Yudo's strength. Like him, Yudo was also a jonin specializing in taijutsu, chakra enhanced strength, gentle fist, byakugan. These three techniques combined were powerful. But Yudo was only 13, lacking in absolute strength and speed. Furthermore, Owl's earth release was very useful in close combat, and he also knew some water release, which was advantageous in the humid environment of the Land of Rain. They were evenly matched. Neither could defeat the other. But Owl knew that a draw meant his victory. He could run back to Kanoha and report Yudo Hyuga. With the information on Yudo's actions in Amige Cure, the arrogant boy would undoubtedly be branded a rogue shinobi, with no place to die. Turning to flee would mean victory. Even though the Byakugan was an excellent tracking tool, Owl, as a seasoned root member, had exceptional stealth skills and was confident in evading Byakugan's vision. These thoughts occurred in a split second. When Owl decided to exchange a few more moves to gather evidence of him attacking me, he suddenly felt a metallic taste. Owl was stunned for a moment, licking his lips. Sure enough, his lips were cracked, with blood seeping from tiny fissures, tasting of iron. In the humid environment of the land of rain cracked lips, this thought flashed through Owl's mind. At the same time, 
he felt an indescribable heat. All the rain within 300 meters had evaporated. It had been vaporized by the high temperature, turning into steam and filling the area. Ordinary people entering here would surely be scalded by the steam. The source of the heat was Yudo Hyuga's right hand. A head-sized armor enveloped his forearm and entire hand, with menacing fangs covering his five fingers. The high temperature that evaporated the rainwater was merely a side effect of the chakra's high-speed flow. The branch family boy's hand was constantly bleeding, with skin cracks faintly revealing the bones inside. This was a technique capable of shaking the shinobi world. Owl's heart was filled with uncontrollable fear. This was the technique he developed in Amage Cure? How could it be such a powerful move? The momentum before its release. Run. I must run. Are you going to run? Yudo smiled happily, as if his arm wasn't about to shatter. A beast won't return to its cage before a full meal. He suddenly disappeared. Faster, faster, and even faster. The armor on his hand cut through the wind, without any resistance. Yudo appeared behind Owl, placing his right hand on Owl's shoulder. Lions, the boy whispered, his five fingers suddenly exerting force. Fong bite. Along with the ground beneath, Owl's body was ground to dust. It was as if this area had been ravaged by a ferocious beast. Yudo landed on the smooth, flattened ground, his right hand hanging limply, clearly with bones completely shattered and the muscles and blood nearly burned dry by the heat. It hurts, damn it. By the time Yudo saw Kanoha in the distance, it had already been half a month since he left. After acquiring the gold and silver from Takeda Takashi, he exchanged the money that very night and purchased a large amount of chemical and medical supplies. He then established two more underground secret bases in the Land of Rain and the Land of Waterfalls. Owl's body had been obliterated, leaving no trace behind, so there was no need for any special disposal. As for Takeda and Keiru's bodies, Yudo buried both of them in the Land of Waterfalls, a place with massive waterfalls and mountains. According to his previous life sayings, it had excellent feng shui. Maybe in the next life, they could become a pair of inseparable lovers. The tasks seemed few but were quite tedious, requiring immense patience. Just finding Kara's corpse remains with his Byakugan took considerable effort from Yudo. When he left the village, the snow reached his calves. Now, upon his return, spring buds had sprouted, and trees had new branches. Winter in the world of Shinobi had ended. It was now the early spring when everything began to grow again. Smelling the faint fragrance of wildflowers and stepping on the slightly moist soil, Yudo walked towards the towering Hokage Rock, re-entering Kanoha. As soon as he passed through the gate, Yudo noticed an unsettling discord. It was clearly the lively early spring, yet there was little joy in the village. Many people had furrowed brows, their steps heavy and hurried. The winds of total war had finally blown to the most stable village, Kanoha. Sighing, the young branch member of the Hyuga clan walked straight into the Senju compound. Half a year ago, upon returning from a mission, he first visited the Hyuga clan head and then reported to the Hokage. However, now, as Tsunade's disciple and having received her permission to leave the village temporarily for training, Yudo naturally went to find his teacher first upon returning. Stepping into the Senju compound, he barely took a few steps before leaping into the air. The next moment, a deep pit appeared where he had just stood. A blonde woman smashed her hand into the ground, the resulting stones flying with more force than a standard shinobi's kunai throw. What a peculiar welcoming ceremony, Tsunade-sensei. Yudo grinned and charged at Tsunade, throwing a punch. Boom. Yudo had reached a decent level of chakra-enhanced strength, making their battle seem earth-shaking. Dust rose throughout the Senju compound, and several buildings collapsed. In the end, Tsunade was still superior. Using a technique akin to gentle fist, she subdued Yudo, pinning his arms behind him and pressing him down while panting heavily. You've gotten a lot stronger, kid. A strand of her blonde hair fell onto Yudo's cheek, tickling him. Yudo chuckled, 
Sensei is one of the legendary Sanin, a mountain I could never hope to surpass. Cut the flattery. Tsunade snorted, releasing his arms. She scrutinized her disciple carefully. You've grown quite a bit taller since you left. Well, you're only thirteen, still growing. Not as tall as Sensei. Your timing, the rhythm of your strikes, and the control of your chakra bursts are vastly improved compared to a few months ago. More importantly, your fists are much harder. You've been training diligently, Yudo. Not as hard as Sensei's. Humph. Tsunade grinned mischievously, messing up his hair. People say the Hyuga prodigy is calm and composed. I see everyone's been fooled by you, little rascal. Yudo, now standing at Tsunade's ear level, felt most comfortable with the height difference. Tsunade, like a delinquent girl, slung her arm around his shoulder as they walked to her place. Tell me, Yudo, Tsunade said, sitting on the tatami mat, leaning back on her arms. Who wanted to send a letter to Jiraiya? Yudo tidied his hair and replied, the leaders of the Akatsuki organization in Amage Cure, Yahiko, Konan, and Nagato. Tsunade tilted her head. I don't know them. Yudo described their appearances, triggering her memory of the three orphans they encountered during the Second Shinobi War in Amage Cure. Those poor kids. I didn't expect them to become capable Shinobi. Sensei, what is Jiraiya-sama's relationship with Yahiko and the others? Jiraiya stayed in the Land of Rain for a while and taught them. Tsunade waved her hand dismissively. The letter has already been delivered to Jiraiya by a reliable person. He appreciates your help. Oh, Yudo blinked. Just a thank you? Wait, that's not right. Jiraiya, known as the Gallant, was generous and wealthy. Delivering a letter might be a small favor, but a mere verbal thanks? He should at least treat me to a lavish meal. Yudo might never know that Jiraiya's thank you gift had already arrived at the Senju compound a few days ago. Tsunade, upon receiving it, was infuriated. Jiraiya's gift was none other than the manuscript of his work, Aika Aika Paradise. Although not yet published, the draft showcased vibrant language, exquisite illustrations, and bold, unrestrained techniques setting a new precedent in the shinobi world. Tsunade tore the book apart in anger. Damn Jiraiya, can't you be serious? My disciple is only thirteen. Such an innocent boy, pure as a blank sheet. And you send him this kind of material? Clearly, he wasn't beaten enough. Tsunade thought, clearing her throat before continuing, let's put Jiraiya aside for now. How's the development of your new jutsu? Almost complete. The offensive part is fully developed. Only the defensive part remains. As Yudo spoke, he unwrapped the bandages on his arms, revealing scarred skin. Using it once destroys 70% of the skin and fractures the bone. Using it a second time will likely evaporate all blood and dehydrate muscles completely. If used a third time consecutively, I'll lose the entire arm. Tsunade straightened, examining his arm. As a master of medical ninjutsu, she could infer the jutsu's immense power just from the scars. Show me the jutsu on the back mountain tomorrow morning, she said seriously. Leave the rest to me. With you here, sensei, I naturally feel at ease. Yudo smiled, wrapping his arms and hands with bandages again. Huh? Sensei, where's Shizen? I sent her to the academy. The blonde beauty yawned. I've been quite busy lately and can't look after her. Letting her go to school to interact with peers is a good thing. Yudo was a bit surprised, Tsunade-sensei. Have you resumed your duties in the village? No, the old man just assigned me some tasks. Oh, by the way, this involves you as well. Tsunade paused before continuing. Yudo, you've been away from the village for two months. How do you feel about the outside world? Life is difficult in most places. The land of fire is still peaceful. Yudo spoke sincerely. Setting aside personal biases, Kanoha is indeed a peaceful place compared to the rest of the world, which is much worse off. Is it chaotic? Very chaotic, Sensei. Around the land of fire, the signs of unknown shinobi appearing are increasing. 
War is imminent, right? Yes. Tsunade nodded. Having experienced the Second Shinobi World War, she was familiar with such situations. It could be tomorrow or the next moment. War could break out any time, depending on who loses patience first. The first combat unit of Kanoha has already assembled, led by Orochimaru. Given the current situation, the village needs a lot of combat power and capable elites. In a few days, the old man will promote a few young people to Jonin. This not only expands the elite team but also boosts morale. Look, the flames of Kanoha burn unceasingly, and excellent seeds keep emerging. The old man insisted I be the chief examiner, probably because he thinks I'm too idle. Ahem. Back to the point, I've seen the list of those to be promoted to Jonin. You're on it, and so is Hataki Kakashi, the son of White Fang. Yudo suddenly felt a sense of relief, thinking, Finally, I have someone above me. With my own sensei as the chief examiner, how can I lose? Perhaps guessing her disciple's thoughts, the blonde woman flicked Yudo's forehead protector. You are my disciple, but I won't go easy on you, understand? Understood. Sensei has a broad mind, embracing the entire village with her tremendous love. He! Tsunade glanced down at herself, feeling that his words had a hint of teasing. If it were Jiraiya speaking, she would have punched him already. But looking up, she saw her thirteen-year-old disciple's pure eyes, in a sense, purer than paper, and immediately felt she was overthinking. Yudo was a very positive kid, unlike that lecherous Jiraiya. The blonde woman coughed lightly to hide her embarrassment. Stop being cheeky. In short, I won't give you special treatment. I'll even make it harder for you to pass because you're my disciple, the genius of the Hokage's lineage, a role model. But if you fail because of this, humph, she clenched her hand, creating a popping sound. Understood. Yudo nodded vigorously. But sensei, I remember my accumulated mission merits are not enough for Jonin promotion. War could break out any time, we can't follow the usual rules. Tsunade stated. Got it, sensei? Oh and these are for you. I went to the land of waterfalls and got some gems, all thumb-sized, perfect for carrying around as natural gambling chips. After having lunch at Tsunade's place and chatting for a while, Yudo left the Senju clan grounds in the afternoon. At this time, due to the tense situation outside, the village had reduced mission assignments and recalled many shinobi. Walking through the village, Yudo encountered many acquaintances. Kakashi Hataki with his half-face mask, the energetic Abito Uchiha, the close friends Saratobi Asuma and Kurin Ayi. He even saw a little kid carrying an even smaller kid buying candy on the street. Sure Sway and Itachi. Itachi was only a few months old, but those distinctive tear troughs made him easily recognizable for his age. Yudo glanced at them but continued on his way. Sure Sway and Itachi could be set aside for now. They were too young to be of any use. Plucking their eyes wouldn't be beneficial yet. Yudo soon arrived at the Hyuga clan grounds. Unexpectedly, he didn't see Hayashi Hyuga. After inquiring, he learned that Hayashi and several other clan leaders had been summoned to the Hokage building for a meeting. War is indeed imminent. With Hayashi away and Haruzen Saratobi likely too busy to listen to his report, Yudo had nothing else to do today. The sudden free time made him feel a bit uneasy. Should I find Sensei? The thought crossed Yudo's mind, but he quickly shook his head. Knowing Tsunade, she was probably getting ripped off at the casino. With nowhere to go, he returned to his home in the Hyuga clan grounds. It was still cold and quiet. After being vacant for two months, cobwebs had formed in the corners. Yudo sighed and took out cleaning tools to thoroughly clean the place. Thanks to his growing body and training in chakra enhanced strength and medical ninjutsu, his coordination had greatly improved, making cleaning much faster. Before dusk, Yudo had cleaned the entire house. Chakra could be seen as the productivity of the shinobi world, highly efficient. With chakra, everything could be done with half the effort. After finishing the chores, Yudo didn't feel hungry. 
He didn't bother cooking and lay in his room, staring blankly at the ceiling. He didn't know how long he laid there, but suddenly, he got up and left the house. Walking out of the clan grounds, down the familiar path, he arrived at his secret training spot. Yudo took a deep breath, feeling much more at ease. When doing nothing, he always felt fear and unease. The cursed seal on his forehead seemed to drive him to keep moving forward without rest. Unlike those relaxed trance migrators who could enjoy a leisurely life, he never experienced that. Born to toil, Yudo mocked himself, dragging out a dummy from a tree hollow and setting it up in the forest. Bang 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 bang. Yudo continuously struck, using all the techniques he had learned. At the point of exhaustion, he finally felt calm. The next morning, at the Senju clan's rear mountain, Yudo sat on a smooth green stone slab, eating rice balls and dried meat that Tsunade brought him, occasionally sipping hot fish soup. At 13, Yudo was at the age when a growing boy can eat an adult out of house and home. As a shinobi, his appetite was enormous. Shizen stared at the empty food box in astonishment, as if seeing a rare animal. You, you won't explode like a balloon, will you? Shizen asked, eyes wide. Of course not, Yudo said, patting his stomach. I'm not foolish. Once I'm full, I stop eating. He paused, puzzled. Sensei is a taijutsu master. Her appetite should be bigger than mine. Nearby, Tsunade, who was fixing her hair, shot him a glare. It's very rude to comment on a lady's appetite, you know. While they talked, Yudo finished his meal and took a deep breath. I'm done. Yeah, about 70% full, which is perfect for training. Shizen picked up the food box and, since she had to go to school, didn't dawdle and skip down the mountain. Tsunade watched her student leave and sighed. You're only a year older than Shizen, yet you're much more mature. Yudo stood up without replying, distancing himself and stretching his wrists and neck, also removing his bandages. Tsunade chuckled. Being cautious, huh? Don't worry, I won't ambush you. She beckoned to him. Come on, use that jutsu on me. Sensei. Yudo said seriously. If I hit you directly, it could be deadly. You won't burst from eating rice balls. Do you think I'm foolish enough to take the hit head on? Tsunade retreated. Come on, my cute student. You're a hundred years too early to think you can kill me. Yudo understood. With her strength of a hundred seal, allowing her to use creation rebirth. Her recovery ability was unparalleled in the ninja world. She could handle it without worry. Heat rose in the back mountain, the leaves instantly dried and withered, and sweat beaded on Tsunade's neck and face. This was just the prelude, nearly setting the forest ablaze. This jutsu's power exceeds my expectations, Tsunade thought. She didn't hesitate, biting her thumb and slamming her hands on the ground. Summoning, Rashomon. Boom. A giant gate appeared in the forest, massive and imposing, like a small mountain, with a grotesque face carved on it, making it intimidating. Lions. Yudo murmured, charging forward. Fong bite. He struck the middle of the summoned Rashomon, the impact shattering the surrounding trees. With a loud boom, Rashomon was penetrated, the edges melting into molten metal. Yudo wavered but quickly reached Tsunade, his right hand striking her abdomen. With the residual force of lion's fong bite, he knocked Tsunade through over ten trees before finally stopping. I overestimated myself. I shouldn't have taken the hit directly, Tsunade thought bitterly but maintained her composure. That's enough. Yudo. The chakra dissipated. Hearing his teacher's words, Yudo quickly withdrew his hand. Tsunade's clothes were shredded at her abdomen, revealing her fair skin, imprinted with Yudo's handprint. Impressive, Yudo. Tsunade examined the damaged Rashomon and her own injuries. Although the high temperature and fangs are flashy, the real damage comes from the rapid flow of chakra. Unlike the Raisingan's central rotation, your jutsu is more complex, with many small vortices and counter-directional mini-whirlwinds. Ouch. She winced, touching her bruises. The internal organs are damaged too. 
it feels like an earth release blunt force, and the air splitting charge resembles lightning release. Honestly, after piercing Rashomon, this still has such power. An ordinary jonin would die from this, and most defensive jutsu would be ineffective. It's an excellent jutsu, very suitable for you, but it has flaws. Your arm must be hard to lift now. The strain on the user is immense. It's unquestionably S-rank, but would also be classified as a forbidden technique. Tsunade rubbed her abdomen, her fair skin marked by burns and cuts, with bruised internal organs beneath. As she pondered how to mitigate the jutsu side effects, Tsunade wasn't a masochist. She had Yudo injure her to better understand the jutsu. Lion's Fong Bite's self-harm aspect stems from its dual nature of damaging the enemy while similarly affecting the user. The difference is merely in degree, but the destructive principle is identical. To perfectly address this burden, one must experience the same trauma as the user. Tsunade's years of combat had ingrained reflexes in her. At the moment Yudo's hand touched her abdomen, she almost instinctively retaliated. She understood that Yudo had a chance to bite through her waist. Yudo, held back at the last moment, Tsunade realized, glancing at him. This student was reliable, understanding the limits. As she healed her abdominal injury, Tsunade contemplated neutralizing the jutsu's severe side effects. The best method would be adding a membrane between the body and the external chakra, blocking the violent chakra's self-harm. However, this would greatly shorten Lion's Fong Bite's duration, even causing it to collapse instantly, as the protective layer would also obstruct Yudo's chakra. Unidirectional fluid transport, Tsunade thought suddenly. It could transmit chakra while blocking destructive force. To her knowledge, no physical material had this property. Reluctantly, she considered that a slug might suffice. Before using the jutsu, Wrapping the slug around the arm could work, as slugs are immune to physical attacks and can transmit chakra as summoned creatures. But this would be too disrespectful to the slug and impractical in the unpredictable conditions of ninja battles. Tsunade rubbed her forehead, suddenly thinking of her, strength of a hundred seal. An alternative approach that didn't involve blocking but a more subtle method to mitigate the damage flashed in her mind. Sealing. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.